Good, bonjour, hi, Canada. It's Hugh Hewitt on June 23rd. It is Wednesday in the year of the plague 2020. So glad you are with me this morning. I'm inside the Beltway where it'll be another steamy day. Inside the Beltway, the big story of the day is it's a continual fight to stop a chop. To stop a chop. Uh, the anarchists and others uh, continually try and build their version of Seattle's quote, autonomous zone, close quote, in the Lafayette Park region of the city across from the White House, and the police continually take it down. As of 2.41 a.m. last night, it had been cleared out again. Uh, understand, that's not going to happen in D.C. That's not going to happen across from the White House under either a Republican or a Democratic president. Uh, we're not going to allow the security threat to the presidency of the United States to occur of a massive buildings and lawless zone. It's just not going to happen. But... Uh, there was no violence last night. The ragtag bag of chopsters uh, get chopped down by the police and, and ushered away. And then they come back because, after all, why go to work? President Trump went to Arizona yesterday. The rundown will play for you some of his comments, both at the border and at the Charlie Kirk event later in the evening. Um, the key thing in D.C. today is it appears that Senate Democrats are going to block a police reform bill in the Senate because it's authored by Tim Scott, and they'd rather have no police reform than a bill authored by an African-American Republican. There are not much differences between the bill. The Senate GOP plan incorporates a number of Democratic proposals, such as legislation to make lynching a federal hate crime. That's not really a Democratic proposal. It's been pushed by Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina, uh, who is a Republican, of course, African-American, Senator Kamala Harris and Senator Booker. It pushes a National Police Commission, which is indeed the brainchild of Gary Peters, a Democrat from New York. But there are some differences on the degree to which a federal mandate would alter practices at police departments across the country. And there is a uh, fundamental difference in banning no-knock warrants. However, the House is going to ban all no-knock warrants. So if the Senate moves its bill forward, they'll go to a conference and figure something out. I don't believe this is going to get out of the Senate for the simple reason. Senate Democrats do not want Tim Scott, African-American senator from South Carolina and a Republican, to get the win. They are putting politics ahead of police reform. So just when you hear the Democrats next talk about police reform, understand they're lying. They don't care about it. They really don't care about it. If they did care about it, you would get 60 votes like that in the United States Senate for Tim Scott's bill. And uh, the Republicans are in control of the chamber. They do not have to accept the wild left wing point of view that is the Kamala Harris. It is up to them to decide. And Democrats can block it and they are going to block it. A uh, great article in the Wall Street Journal today on homicide in Seattle's no cop zone. I've tweeted it out. You be, should be following me on Twitter. By the way, the show is broadcast live on YouTube. Just go to YouTube, type in my name, and you'll see it. The Justice Department and state attorney generals are conferring on getting Google into court on antitrust charges. Good. About time. Now to the virus. We have 9.1 million cases across the country, across the globe. 9.1 million cases. Seoul, Korea is the latest place for a second wave, but according to the Wall Street Journal, the global economy shows signs of pulling out of its slump. That leads me to the morning markets report brought to you, of course, by Birch Gold. To get your gold, you go to hughgold.com, hughgold.com, and you should diversify. I, I feel bad every morning, I tell you about this. If you had texted my name, Hugh, to 474747 yesterday, you'd be happy today because gold went up almost three quarters of a percent overnight. It's at 1795. It's now up about $400, 1795 
Since I first told you, you really ought to diversify into gold during this period of uncertainty, and I continue to tell you that. Birch Gold will help you diversify, but you've got to go to hughgold.com first, or text my name, Hugh, to 474747. 47 47. Uh, overnight, uh, the Japan index went down 0.07%, and the Hong Kong index went down 0.5%. Markets in England and Germany late into the day are down two and a half and two and a quarter percent, respectively. Uh, crude oil's down a little bit below 40 at 39.84, still way off of the lows of 17 and 16 dollars. The 10 year treasury remains at 0.71 percent. I have no idea what stocks are going to do today. Yesterday, I had no idea, but in fact, Amazon went up 50 dollars a share yesterday. And I, it's the only stock I own, I keep looking at it in amazement. $50.59 to $2,764 a share. Some analysts say it's a $4,000 stock. I don't know. I don't do stock picking. But I do read here, Brazil e-commerce jumps 57% in the first five months of 2020. Why is that? Because South America is now experiencing what North America experienced three months ago, which is the peak of the flu. They're in their flu season. And it's really crushing Brazil, so people are staying inside. The number of online orders grows 65% in three categories, cosmetics and perfumes, furniture, and electronics. Isn't that amazing? 65% in one quarter. Um, from the Wall Street Journal, global economy shows signs of pulling out of its slump. That is primarily because it's a North American economy. Uh, but also in the New York Times, virus gains steam across Latin America. In Mexico especially, the pandemic has now infected more than 460,000 people, and they don't have great testing in Mexico. Uh, and so testing, more tests means more positives and more negatives. And we know we have a better handle on the disease in the United States than anywhere in the world because we have by far the most tests. But all across the globe, the virus is everywhere. It's taking its mortality of between 2 and 5% everywhere. And it's going to continue to do so. But the global economy is adjusting and rebounding. The Telegraph today has Boris Johnson, bold, punchy, optimistic. The old Boris Johnson is back at last. He has totally recovered from the pandemic. That is good news. Here is Donald Trump in Yuma yesterday talking about the fence. He's standing in front of the fence. And this is what he had to say, cut number seven. And I'm thrilled to be in Yuma, Arizona. They've treated me very nicely in Arizona, so we're very happy about that, Mr. Governor, right? To commemorate the completion of more than 200 miles of powerful border wall, we're on pace to complete 450 miles by the end of the year and 500 miles almost immediately thereafter. We may even have the 500 miles by the end of the year. We're doing a real job. The Army Corps of Engineers, I want to thank them. They've been incredible. This is the most powerful and comprehensive border wall structure anywhere in the world. It's got technology that nobody would even believe between uh, sensors and cameras and everything else. With us today are Acting Secretary of Homeland Security, Chad Wolf, who has done a fantastic job. Thank you, Chad. And it, it was an impressive display down there. Doug Ducey is a great governor of Arizona. I believe Trump's going to carry Arizona. I think Martha McSally is going to be the next senator. She's doing better and better every single day. But the president also had a message for those impacted by DACA. Cut number 11. Well, we're looking at it. We're working out with DACA. I think good things are happening with DACA. Uh, they resubmit, but we'll work it out. And the Democrats have been playing with DACA for years and they haven't done anything. I'll get it done. I'll get it done. And we'll, good things will happen for DACA recipients. And pretty soon. Is there a message? So we'll, the good yeah. things are going to happen for DACA recipients. One more cut. He did get in a jab at Biden. Cut number nine. So I just want to thank everyone, the uh, Biden people, and he's controlled totally by the radical left, as you understand. He's not controlling it. They're controlling him. They want open borders. They want criminal sanctuaries. They want everything that doesn't work. I don't even think it works uh, politically, frankly, at this point. People see what happened. You'll take a look at what's happening in Seattle or take a look. Minnesota such a great, great state, but you look at Minneapolis and you see what happened there until we sent in. We sent in the National Guard. 
We said, you got to do it. As soon as they were there, boom, shut down. All the problems they had shut down. You didn't hear about them. What the president is going to run on is not against Joe Biden because he's hapless figurehead, but against the radical left behind him. The radical left, by the way, has beaten Elliot Engel in New York. They're slow to declare it, but a longtime Democratic dinosaur tossed out by another member of the AOC squad. As the Democratic Party continues to lurch left, more coming up on this Wednesday edition of The Hugh Hewitt Show. Stay tuned. This is Lon Hee Chen of the Hoover Institution for townhall.com. Public health officials across America have spent the last several months warning about the dangers of the coronavirus and the need for us to stay at home, halt economic activity, and avoid social interactions with our friends and neighbors. We are now reopening our economy in many parts of the country, but these same public health officials have compromised their own credibility as we do so. On the one hand, they've urged caution and a slow return to work, school, and faith gatherings. They've criticized those who oppose the stay-at-home orders. But at the same time, these officials have been broadly supportive of the large protests on America's streets in the last few weeks. Public health officials should be helping us understand the comparative risks of activities, not endorsing the causes they like while prohibiting the ones they don't. Their hypocrisy is costly indeed. They have impacted our ability to address future health crises. I'm Lan Hee Chen. ADF, fighting for those whose liberties are being violated. Attention business owners, as America gets back to work, will customers know you're there? With little warning, the coronavirus attacked our nation and our well-being in ways we never anticipated. The tragic loss of life, unprecedented economic upheaval, and a shattered sense of security has left many individuals and businesses in shambles. While the aftershocks could be felt for months to come, they may not have to. There is hope for an extraordinary turnaround of your bottom line. But will you be prepared for America's grand reopening? All signs point to the biggest business opportunity of our lifetime, coming as early as this summer. A recent survey of local advertisers shows a 10-point jump in the number of local advertisers who plan to maintain or increase their spending. One in four businesses expect to spend more in advertising by the end of June, and more than half expect to restart or surge their spending by this summer. As the numbers forecast increased spending from advertisers across the country, will your message be seen and heard? Will your business benefit from the pent-up consumer demand? Salem Surround is prepared to help you deliver the right advertising message to reach all potential customers wherever they are. Your business can be ready for a post-COVID-19 economy, but the time to act is now. Be at the front of the line as our economy begins to fire on all cylinders once again. For a free assessment of your marketing message and strategy, visit SalemSurround.com or contact your local media strategist today. Trending now on The Larry Elder Show. You write in your book, uh, Amity Schlaes, quote, most Americans shared something else with Harrington, confidence. In the 1930s, the New Deal had failed to reduce unemployment. The prolonged periods of joblessness were what had made the Depression great. But the memory of the New Deal failure had faded just enough that younger people liked the sound of the term. And memories of more recent successes fueled Americans' current ambitions. Many men were veterans, end of quote. This confidence that we could reorient society, we could cure poverty, as you pointed out. This is what drove a lot of this stuff. Oh, yes. Well, you know, it's always, I was looking at a, a flip chart, uh, a flip picture today, you know, on the internet where they said, well, racism is a result of capitalism. We need socialism to get rid of racism. And I thought, wow, that's that's pretty intense. Um, but a lot, and uh, pretty wrong-headed. But a lot of young people believe that uh, the epigram of of the current book, Great Society, which I hope your listeners will pick up, is a lot of facts you may mm -hmm. may have uh, thought about before, but never seen laid out. Is nothing new, just forgotten. And now here we are. People are just wealthy enough. Unemployment has been low just long enough that we forgot what it was like to have higher unemployment or to see companies fail or um, to understand that the government can't afford everything. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today.
Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Spotify set the fetching Mrs. Hewitt 50 years of songs of the summer yesterday. So I provided to Adam Youngman to become our bump music for a couple of weeks. Summer songs only. President decided to begin summer in Arizona. Always an unusual choice to go to Arizona in June. Uh, Doug Ducey, I love you. In fact, I'm going to have on a young Arizonan who's running for office at the end of the show today. Alex Culloden is running for Arizona State Senate. And I love Arizona, but I mean, going there in June, and I guess it's better than going in July. But the, uh, the president went and talked to the Turning Point Action speech at the Dream City Church in Arizona. Here's what he had to say, cut number 19. You're fighting against an oppressive left-wing ideology that is driven by hate and seeks to purge all dissent. And you understand that, amazing at that age. Your young people generally, a couple of oldsters out there, friends of mine. The radical left demands absolute conformity from every professor, researcher, reporter, journalist, corporation, entertainer, politician, campus speaker, and private citizen. But we have Charlie, and we have our people, and our people are stronger. Our people are stronger. And our people are smarter, and we are the elite. We are the elite. You know, do you ever notice? They said it two weeks ago. I was talking to somebody. She says, well, you know the elite. I said, what are you talking about, the elite? Who's the elite? They're the elite? They're not the elite. You're the elite. You are. You're smarter. You're better looking. Have a better future. You know your way around better, believe it or not. There's only one thing they have. They're more vicious. They are vicious. They are vicious people. Anyone who dissents from their orthodoxy must be punished, canceled, or banished. That includes from television, you see it. But you will not be silenced. And you know, the bottom line, I get interviewed by people, and I'm sitting the other day in the Oval Office, and I didn't like the tone, and I said, you know, it's really nice because I'm here and you're not. <laughs> I look at The president is having fun with Charlie Kirk's group Turning Point. He did, however, take time to embrace the vision of Martin Luther King, cut number 20. While their movement is based on hate, ours is based on love love of our family, love of our nation, and love of our fellow citizens. We embrace the noble vision of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and believe that People should not be judged based on the color of their skin, but the content of their character. You know, it's a great thing when the president repeats the most famous line by Dr. King. It is unfortunate that the left in America no longer believes that. Uh, but the radical left in America is the radical left in America. The president spoke about the radical left in Seattle. Cut number 21. This is a choice of two futures. The left's vision of disunity and discord, or our vision of equal opportunity and equal justice. Every American should take a long look at the bedlam in Seattle, because that's exactly what will come to every city near you, every suburb and community in America, if the radical left Democrats are put in charge. He is right. He is right. Seattle is a crystal ball. Seattle is your future. Chop. The chop shop that they attempted to put up last night in D.C. got taken down because the federal government controls D.C. and that ain't happening. Uh, long ago and far away, I drafted the rules and regulations for Lafayette Park. You're allowed to demonstrate in Lafayette Park. You're not allowed to camp in Lafayette Park. And there will be no chop shop established in Lafayette Park. The one in Seattle's already had a murder, two other shootings. It's already chaotic. It's already falling apart, but there isn't even going to be the first week of a chop shot in D.C. Not happening inside the Beltway. Don't go anywhere, America. Coming right back on the Hugh Hewitt Show.
Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you in part by the Job Creators Network Foundation. America has been doing some soul searching lately. Perhaps you noticed we're examining what's right with America and what can be made better. No other country does this kind of introspection better than us. Some of what we found we don't like and will change. Every life has the right to be treated with dignity and respect. That includes our law enforcement as well as every skin color. We've been through this before in America. And we always came out stronger. We will this time too. Our hosts will make sure of that. We are the answer. Trending now on the Dennis Prager Show. You learn a lot on a construction site. You really learn yes. everything you need to know on a construction site. It's all there. And, uh, and when you go through that and you see how that works physically, it, it's helpful. It, it, it gives you a sort of clarity. Let me ask you a question. I just want to say to the public, he has two really wonderful children. I, I, they, are, they are kind, mature well-mannered they're really wonderful kids are they being affected forget the covid uh, lockdown are they being affected by the rioting and and the turbulence well they're being affected they're not being affected by what's going on in the streets but they're definitely being affected by the political climate um they graduated the eighth grade they have a, they have to put their statement, you know, a song lyric or a cliche or string some words together under their picture. My son is a little bit of a rebel. And he said, he announced at the table, he was going to put make America great again under his picture. My daughter said, no, you know, you're not because you won't be able to show up at school on the ninth grade. I don't want to be, I don't want to be chased around with a stick for my entire high school career. Oh, God. Think about that. You're doing such a good job. <laughs> Folks, this is, a, <laughs> no, no. he's terrific. Watch us in, uh, in No Safe Spaces and get his book. I'm your emotional support animal, Adam Carolla. Even though you're a lefty, we have a lot in common. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Mike Gallagher Show. I think the New York media is describing Florida as coronavirus raging through the state. That's literally the word they're using, at least in the New York Post. But there's a peculiar there's a peculiarity about these these uh, data driven news reports. All the always at the bottom of the article at the end of the report, they admit that deaths and hospitalizations are down, and hospital capacity is nowhere near being stretched thin. I, I don't understand it any more than I can make sense of a of a guy like Anthony Fauci who told us that masks don't work and they're not effective and you shouldn't go around wearing a mask, you're causing more problems than, than solutions, and then admitting that w those were lies because they were worried that we would, you know, scarf up all the face masks from the hospital workers. And now, if you live in California, soon to be Texas, Tampa, Florida, you don't wear a mask. I guess you're breaking the law. I don't know what they're going to do to you if you don't have a mask. Think there'll be a mask jail? Will there be a prison for people who refuse to wear a mask? I'm serious. They're going to lock people up? You're just going to give you a fine? You're going to pay a fine if you refuse to wear a mask? I saw a, a conservative activist got kicked off a flight. He was trying to get to Tulsa. Uh, on an airplane, they kicked him off the plane. I believe it was American Air American Airlines. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Eric Metaxas Show. Given merit and basis through higher education and college campuses, through an intelligentsia of left-wing Marxist radicals, that have been given undeserved credibility 
for absolute garbage, foolish ideas. For everyone listening to this, if you are worried about this, the, the continual decline of America into chaos or into our anarchy or, or the, the continue, as America's continue to trend, I want you to ask yourself the question, am I actually supporting it without even realizing it? Because I know a lot of your listeners, Eric, they say, oh, no, 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 I, I don't support the downfall of America. I'm very careful where I shop and wh what I do and where I go to church. Maybe if you send your kid to a college, I'm not saying it's the right thing or the wrong thing. But you very well might be financially assisting the greatest threat to the future of America. And if you're voluntarily donating money as an alumni, you're absolutely doing that. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Welcome Thanks. back, America. 33 minutes after the hour. Spotify summer songs from over the decades proves that it doesn't take much to break into the, uh, the hot song of the summer category. Good morning to you. I hope you are enjoying your drive to work. Insurgent Jamal Bowman holds a lead over veteran Representative Elliot Engel in the most watched race. The uh, Kentucky Senate race also matters, but they won't know the result in Kentucky uh, for a week. So they voted yesterday on the 23rd. They're not going to know until the 30th because they allowed mail-in votes for the first time in the bluegrass state. And so with it, we won't know. This is going to be, by the way, it's a foreshadowing of November. We won't know who won where uh, for a week. Don't plan on a vacation after the election is done because the election won't be done. But we do know that in the uh, 16th congressional district, which in, encompasses part of the Bronx and Westchester, one of the old dinosaurs of the Democratic Party, Elliot Engel. I mean, he's just been around doing nothing for decades, but he's part of Team Pelosi. He's getting pushed aside by Team AOC, uh, by a young and fiery middle school principal who is just going to get crushed, um, uh, who is just going to crush him. His name is Jamal Bowman. And Jamal Bowman is like the rest of the squad, hard left. And the hard left has taken over the Democratic Party. It is that simple. Uh, president sat down with my friend Brian Kilmeade at the White House yesterday talking, oh, well, about a number of things. First of all, he talked about if Biden were to win and become the president, cut number one. I don't like it at all. I don't like anything that's going on. Now, federal, I've stopped. I've stopped federal. But the states are, a lot of states are weak. A lot of people are weak. And they're allowing it to happen. Hey, it's going over a little bit around the world now. They want to remove the statue of Gandhi, okay? All he wanted was peace. They want to take down Ulysses S. Grant. Well, he's the one that stopped the Confederates, right? So, you know, he was a great general. He turned, nobody's stock went higher than his stock over the last 10 or 15 years. But do you understand um, how you look at Thomas Jefferson, you look at George Washington, you look at James Monroe, you look at James Madison. One thing they had, they were brilliant. They also had slaves. Yeah. So how do we, grow as a country, but yet not forget our past. So you have to understand history and you have to understand the culture and so many other aspects of our country. And people can study that and they can hate it and let's all hate it. But you can't take down George Washington's statue and half of our country is named after Washington. You can't, we have to remember the heritage, the, the, the culture of our country and you know, this is less important, but it's very important. Some of the things that they're trying to destroy are magnificent pieces of art. Have you ever seen an area where a statue was removed and you look at the area and they put blacktop over the top of it? They put asphalt over the top and that's the end. And it was the center of a town or the, you know, a village. And now the statue has gone and the whole village is like a different place. Uh, and here's the other problem I have. A lot of these people, that want it down, don't even know what they're taking down. I watch them on television and I see what's happening and they're ripping down things. They have no idea what they're ripping down. But they started off with the Confederate and then they go to 
Ulysses S. Grant. Well, what's that all about? And they would knock down Lincoln. There's a group that wants to take down Lincoln. They haven't figured out exactly why yet. Uh, ah! George Washington, Thomas Stop. Jefferson. That, you know, the, he's right. There is no uh, rule of reason here. They don't. They, they, going after U.S. Grant is just crazy. They also took down Unipro Sarah, uh, Saint Sarah, uh, in a great move that the radical left hates the Roman Catholic Church. Just understand that the radical left will be. So say goodbye to the free exercise clause. We get a big decision, I think, tomorrow on the free exercise clause. I'll keep you posted on that. Cut number two, Brian Kilmeade asked the president about why he only had 6,000 people in Tulsa. Cut number two. When I went there, it was the first time. Now, I heard two weeks of nothing but you are going to die if you go. You are going to die. You'll never live again. You'll never breathe again if you walk into that very beautiful arena. They treated us very nicely, except for one problem. They called a curfew so people that were in line had to leave you had people sitting waiting for four or five days in advance and they called a curfew and they had to leave i don't know where they went but they had to leave you know that and then i called up and i said it shouldn't be curfew i called the mayor and i said mayor you can't do a curfew it's not fair to our people they called a curfew because you had some very bad people coming they did come, and the police did a good job, but they called curfew, number one. Number two, you had nothing but horrible press for a week and a half, two weeks leading up to it, that you were going to be in bad shape if you walked into the arena, and various other things. Now, despite that, we actually had a good crowd. For anybody else, it would be a good crowd, but I agree with you. It's the only time that I've had a vacant seat since I came down the escalator with the First Lady. But it is the only time, and it's because of COVID. I mean, I, I, people ought to realize some people are not going to go out because they are more risk averse or they got asthma or something. They're just not going to do it. But he did point out to Brian Kilmeade, the telev television audience that he achieved for Fox, cut number three. Fox put it out. Yeah, I mean, Fox put it out. So it's the biggest, uh, the largest Saturday night audience in its history. Um, Nobody's going to say that. I'll say it. I'm saying it now. If I didn't say it, they'll put it out. Nobody's going to pick it up because the fake news won't do that. But think of what that means. Now, a lot of people saw it. A lot of people went to Tulsa and it was rough because they had, you know, so-called protesters, anarchists and various other people. And they said, let's go home and watch it on television. But this is much more important. Mm -hmm. We had a very nice crowd of warriors. They were warriors. But it's the first empty seat. But these are the best ratings we've ever had. Interesting. I think that means something because that to me is like a poll. Right. And online even better. Online even better. Donald Trump then talks about Ambassador John Bolton, his former national security advisor, cut number four. Right, look, this is a guy with no personality. All he wanted to do is drop bombs on everybody. He got us, he was one of the many people that got us into the war in the Middle East, which was a big mistake. I said to him, let me ask you, do you think recently, I said, what did you think? He said, I think we made the right decision. I said, you lost me there. It was the worst decision in the history of our country. I know you may disagree with that. Worst, well, now you might agree. At the time, you would have, you know, felt differently. But also, the Libyan model, you know what that means, right? Look it up. One of the dumbest things ever said, I think it was said on Deface the Nation, the Libyan model, he said the Libyan model, that was set us back, you have no idea. John Bolton was a stupid guy, and he was a guy with no heart. And he also had a statement that he would lie whenever he had to. He has that statement, it's a well-known statement. And I fired him, and I didn't think it was a big deal. And I, didn't, I wasn't around him very much. But what he did do is he took classified information and he published it during a presidency. It's, not, you know, it's one thing to write a book after, during. And I believe that he's a criminal. And I believe, frankly, he should go to jail for that. You, you know, I, I put out yesterday, you really can't prosecute John Bolton uh, because the consequences of pulling in all of the witnesses that he could pull in would be so extraordinary. Could do a grand jury. If you wanted to, you could do a grand jury. Uh, we'll wait and see. The president also went out on the White House lawn and he talked about vandals who tear down statues. Cut down statues. Cut down number five. Uh, last night we stopped an attack on a great monument 
the monument of Andrew Jackson in Lafayette Park. And I just want to thank law enforcement. They did a great job. We were working very closely with the White House Secret Service and some of our executives. It was really, they did a great job. They stopped the call. Uh, numerous people are in jail and going to jail today. Uh, people are already there, but we're looking at long-term sentences under the Act. We have a very specific Monuments Act, and we are looking at long-term jail sentences for these vandals and these hoodlums and these anarchists and agitators and call them whatever you want. Some people don't like that language, but that's what they are. You know, I never knew that there was a statute prohibiting the defacement of federal statues honoring veterans. I never knew. I'm 64 years old. I've been practicing law since 1983. I've been in the Department of Justice, the White House Counsel's Office, General Counsel of two federal agencies. I've been in uh, state and local government for an additional 22 years after that in a variety of appointed positions. I've been broadcasting since 1990. I never knew there was a statute for which there are criminal penalties if you deface the statue honoring a U.S. military veteran. Never knew that. That was discovered by Senator Tom Cotton and uh, his team. And my hat is off to them because it's up to the federal government now, not the state governments, to decide we're going to come and indict you and arrest you for defacing a federal statute honoring a military veteran. Andrew Jackson was a great president. He was also a slave owner. So you understand him in the round. And he was also a violent man. He was in a number of duels, but he shook up. That's why Jackson is in the, in the Oval. The presidents always put up the people they admire the most in the Oval. And uh, I think Donald Trump takes a lot of inspiration from Jackson's bellicosity, his pugnaciousness. Not from the fact that he was a slave owner. Of course not. That's like, no one approves of that. But uh, Jackson will be defended in Lafayette Park. And those people are going to go to jail. Uh, the president also repeated uh, truism, which I, I guess the major media just doesn't understand this. Cut number six. I don't kid. Let me just tell you. Let me make it clear. We have got the greatest testing program anywhere in the world. We test better than anybody in the world. Our tests are the best in the world, and we have the most of them. By having more tests, we find more cases. What do people not understand about this? And I'm glad now that we can, you can get a test in a doctor's office. If you want a test, you can go get a test. Two months ago, that wasn't true. People were worried. They had the sniffles. You know, my allergies are deadly. They're just complete coming back. But I've always known they're allergies. They're not COVID. But a lot of people get worried and they want to get tested. And they couldn't get tested two months ago. Now, if you can't get tested, you're a moron. They're everywhere. And so uh, you can go find out if you got COVID. And yes, you're going to find more cases of COVID. It, what matters, listen to me, what matters is ICU admissions and what really matters are death. And in the United States, the deaths have gone down and down and down because the treatments have gotten better and better and better. Uh, it doesn't mean that there aren't people with fragile underlying medical conditions like heart disease and obesity and other uh, diabetes, other comorbidities that may kill them if they get the virus. But if you're going to get it, there's no better place to get it than the United States of America. Now, relieffactor.com at time of the morning. Only six yesterday. The Washington, D.C. summer has set in. So instead of eight like Monday, I only did six yesterday. I don't know about today. I got to find out what it could be 100 degrees by the time I get out there. And lukewarm coffee, the very last sip of it, relieffactor.com makes it possible no matter what age you are. You could be 20, you could be 80. It's going to help you. I carry in curcumin, resveratrol, and omega. And so why do people take supplements? Some people take like a thousand supplements. And I understand them. There are some doctors, and including a good friend of mine's good doctor, believes in like 100 different pills a day. And some people take no supplements. They don't even take a vitamin. And for years, I was just a vitamin guy. And then I started taking uh, relieffactor.com. And I believe it's made all the difference in the world in getting back. I, I, I ran a dozen marathons in my 30s, 20s and 30s. Uh, but as you get older, you get slower. And that's fine. But you also, it, your knees bark at you. Your back hurts you. Well, relieffactor.com helps with that. Don't stop taking what your doctor prescribes for you, but do start taking relieffactor.com. Is Tim Scott's bill going to pass? I asked David Drucker, the Washington Examiner, next. Stay tuned.
Trending now on America First with Sebastian Gorka. I keep asking you the same question every week because I still don't get it. The greatest nation on God's earth, uh, until the coronavirus, the Wu flu, the biggest economy the world had ever seen, the markets returned to where they were pre-COVID, and then there's these weird skittish moments where, where there's a flutter on the market and there's a sudden drop because, what, four Apple stores are closing? Trish, what's going on? Well, yeah, you know, Seb, people are, are nervous right now. There's still a lot of volatility out there because they're, they're trying to figure out, is this for real, right? Like, they, they want to make sure that this economic recovery is indeed for real. And when you hear about Apple stores shutting down, when you hear about states getting very nervous about reopening, they're saying to themselves, wait a second, we're not going to have a repeat of what we just went through, are we? And I think that the short answer to that is, of course, no. But nonetheless, it's how committed are American consumers going to be? How, how committed is corporate America in this new environment to move forward? Um, and, and that's what it's going to come down to, right? Because if we start to backpedal here, if we start to say, okay, now we're shutting everything down. If schools don't start in September, then you run the risk of another shutdown and another, you know, economic, frankly, catastrophe. Because that's what that was. They caused... This was sort of self-inflicted, an economic catastrophe. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Larry Elder Show. You know, the idea of shutting down our economy was just, you know, awful. I mean, and by the way, the people who suffered the most, Larry, were the lowest income people, black Americans. We have the best. Do you know, uh, Larry, from 2017 through 2020, what demographic group saw the fastest rise in incomes? Blacks. Black Americans. Mm -hmm. Yes, I knew you knew that. And, and my, you know, wait a minute. How could that happen? We've got a racist president. How could that have happened? We had more economic advance in three years for black Americans under Trump than we did in eight years under Obama. Stephen Moore is my guest. Uh, he was an economic advisor to President Trump. Um, President Trump, to me, I could be completely wrong. You would know more than I would about this. Instinctively, he didn't want to shut down the economy, did he? Oh, Trump did not want to shut down the economy. No way. Mm -hmm. He got terrible advice from Fauci, who's, you know, a disaster as, the, as his uh, health advisor. Uh, and I'll tell you this, you know, we, we can't undo what has been done. But there, Donald Trump is not going to shut down this economy again. I guarantee you that. Mm -hmm. I mean, now the left is saying, oh, we have to shut down the economy again because we've had a few more cases of coronavirus. Uh, no. We, look, the vast, vast, vast majority of the, of the uh, people who've gotten very sick and have died from coronavirus are people over the age of 65 or 70. So let's keep those people healthy. But, uh, you know, we've got to get, you can't keep an economy down. And I actually think it's because we did this, we locked down the economy for two or three months that we have these riots in the street. You can't keep young people locked up for, with nothing to do. Good morning, America. Hugh Hewitt on Wednesday, the 24th of June, 2020. The Songs of Summer, according to Spotify. I think this was one of David Drucker's favorite. I think he was a big Carpenters fan. Am I right about that, David Drucker? You know, funny you should say that, because my first memories as a kid, about three years old, are my parents playing a, a Carpenters LP, a record, in our living room, and me singing the words as best you know, a three-year-old can. So I, I have most of that album, including this song, memory. <laughs> Well, there you go. I knew you were a Carpenters fan. Uh, Drucker, you cover Congress. Uh, David M. Drucker on Twitter. Uh, for the Washington Examiner, I want to know if Tim Scott's bill is going to pass or not. What do you hear? Well, look, right now Democrats are planning to hold it up as far as we can tell. Now, look, I'm spending most of my time on the campaign, but I've been watching this closely because obviously this issue is now such a big part of the 2020 debate, and uh, Democrats, you know, are indicating they're going to filibuster. And so... If they're going to filibuster, there's not going to be a bill. Now, it could be a negotiating tactic. Maybe they want to try and squeeze more out of the bill. But, look, I've been watching this sort of thing over the past, you know, 
10 or 15 years that I've been here, uh, the minority in the Senate has the power of the filibuster to try and either block things they don't want, prevent victories by the majority, or, or squeeze out uh, concessions. So I think that the issue here is, you know, why the Democrats, why the Democrats in the Senate are, are blocking it. And it, I don't think we totally know yet. And it, it sort of depends, I think, also on any political pressure they may feel because when you're in the minority and you can scream all you want about this is unfair, they didn't include us in the negotiations, but a lot of times the voters will just ask, why are you blocking, you know, at least some attempt to move the ball forward? And it's, it's, it, it can be hard to make the case. Not always. I mean, when Republicans tried and failed to filibuster Obamacare, the politics of that worked out for them in the end in the 2010 elections and the 2014 elections. Uh, but sometimes these things don't work. So as a matter of politics, it will have to see. No, I, I have been reading the Washington Post account, and uh, it's written by Sung Min Kim, who's a very, very good reporter, as you know. Uh, sure. She said there's a lot of agreement between the Senate Democrats and Republicans. They have long agreed to make lynching a federal hate crime. Now, I, you know, that's more symbolic than it is real. Uh, lynching gets prosecuted when it happens. Uh, but they do want to set up a national policing commission which was a move by Democrat Gary Peters of Michigan, who may be the second most vulnerable Democrat in America. And uh, John uh, James running a campaign up in Michigan is pretty strong. And, but there are some disagreements on whether or not there will be a mandate to change policing practices like chokeholds. These are not major deals. The Senate could pass the bill. The House is going to pass a bill. And the traditional thing is, you go to conference and you iron out. But I personally believe Democrats don't want Tim Scott to have a win because Tim Scott threatens them. I also think they're worried that, that President Trump's going to switch out Mike Pence and put Tim Scott on the ticket. I don't think that's going to happen, but I think they're worried about it. Does Tim Scott present them with a unique political challenge, David Drucker? I really don't think this is a Tim Scott issue. I mean, Tim Scott is, um, you know, a real workhorse in the Senate. He's not. You know, he doesn't run around the country giving high-profile speeches all the time, but he, he gets involved in a lot of policy issues, and, and he's been involved here. I, I think it's more an issue, uh, potentially, uh, of not wanting to produce legislation possibly that President Trump can sign and therefore claim as a, a political victory. Now, you know, if you talk to Democrats, they're going to outline all the ways in which the Tim Scott legislation falls short. And, you know, there, there are Senate Democrats that would like more out of it. But in the House, you're going to have a lot more disagreement. Um, and so notwithstanding, you know, your comment about conference committee, which is right, you know, that the way it's supposed to work is the two chambers then go to conference, negotiate, compromise to the two bills that might be wildly different, and then you go on from there. I think in an election year when uh, partisanship is hot and Given the COVID crisis and now uh, the George Floyd unrest, um, things are really hot. I just think it's hard for Democrats and Republicans to come together and give each side some sort of uh, win. And I think everybody starts to put everything on hold and say, I think I can win in November. I think Democrats are looking at that in particular. They're looking at all the polls and they're saying, look, we have a chance to possibly win the Senate, win the White House. Why are we going to give a concession now, give Trump anything to hold on to when we could basically run the, you know, run the road after November um, and do everything we want? Uh, last question. Is Seattle helping or hurting Democrats? I don't think it's hurting Democrats because it's isolated. I think if this was the sort of thing where it was popular, and I've been talking about this, if this had popped up in a, you know, a dozen or two dozen cities all over the country and there was just rampant lawlessness, uh, I think you know, that might be an issue. But here you have the issue of one city with a weak mayor uh, where things are out of control and it hasn't presented Democrats with having to confront you know, some sort of widespread issue. So I don't think this is a problem for them. I don't know if the silent majority is big enough to win the election, David, but the silent majority is definitely watching Seattle. It just is. And we'll see whether or not chop shops spring up across the United States. They're not happening in D.C. David M. Drucker on Twitter. Thank you, America. Follow me to hour number two of this morning's Hugh Hewitt show.
This is Lon He Chen of the Hoover Institution for townhall.com. Public health officials across America have spent the last several months warning about the dangers of the coronavirus and the need for us to stay at home, halt economic activity, and avoid social interactions with our friends and neighbors. We are now reopening our economy in many parts of the country, but these same public health officials have compromised their own credibility as we do so. On the one hand, they've urged caution and a slow return to work, school, and faith gatherings. They've criticized those who oppose the stay-at-home orders. But at the same time, these officials have been broadly supportive of the large protests on America's streets in the last few weeks. Public health officials should be helping us understand the comparative risks of activities, not endorsing the causes they like while prohibiting the ones they don't. Their hypocrisy is costly indeed. They have impacted our ability to address future health crises. I'm Lan He Chen. ADF, fighting for those whose liberties are being violated. Trending now on The Dennis Prager Show. Hi, everybody. Dennis Prager with you. Somebody sent me a video of two uh, black guys who uh, were uh, big fans of America. And they showed video after video of quite awful conduct by police against whites. I remembered one of them where the guy was begging for his life, and it's not quite clear to anybody why he got killed. And said it, and they made the point, which is irrefutable. Had this been a black person, it, it, everybody would have known his name, and it would have been a, a major cause celeb in the United States. There is actually more of that against whites than against blacks, according to uh, all the data that we have the police are overwhelmingly not biased against blacks and certainly not in any use of lethal force but the entire movement is not based on fact it is based on emotion and as far as the left is concerned it is based on a desire for chaos and ultimately the end of the united states as we know it if you're still in doubt, there's nothing I can say. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Mike Gallagher Show. The president was interviewed, I think on it was on Fox News, I think it was Sean Hannity. The president responded to what happened with, I think, uh, I don't think this is a controversial view, but maybe you do. Here was the president last night with Sean on Fox News Channel. I thought it was uh, a terrible situation, but you can't resist a police officer. And, you know, if you have a disagreement, you have to take it up after the fact. It was a very sad, very, very sad thing. It's going to be up to justice. I hope he gets a fair shake because police have not been treated fairly in our country. They have not been treated fairly. Is President Trump uh, controversial with that remark? It was a very sad thing. He said it was a terrible thing. But you can't resist the police. Is resisting the police acceptable to anybody? Thank you to uh, whoever texted me on the My Pillow text line, the image of Leslie Nielsen. I think it's from Naked Gun. And again, all hell breaking loose behind him. And he's saying... He's saying, nothing to see here. Please disperse. That's what America feels like right now, isn't it? Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Eric Metaxas Show. Hey there, folks. Welcome. I'm talking to my friend Dinesh D'Souza. He has a new book out today. It's called United States of Socialism. Who's behind it? Why it's evil? How to stop it? I have to say that I have been uh, fascinated, not necessarily too surprised by the cravenness of uh, American corporations in their dealings with China. They're willing to do business with people whose view of human rights in the Communist Party in China is, is not that different uh, from slave owners uh, in, in America before the Civil War. In other words, it's very, very dirty money, and they don't seem to be using uh, the power they have 
uh, to get leverage over the human rights situation. They simply uh, seem to be willing uh, to let it ride. And it seems that Trump is the first president we've had that has identified the problem and that is willing to take on uh, China, which is, of course, a vast socialist communist power. What, what do you think of that situation? I think for corporations, you're quite right. They, they don't have any patriotic loyalty to the United States. Uh, they're happy to offshore, if you will, the slave labor. They're just looking at what in by, by and large is called the China price. If, in other words, if they can make something cheaper over there, we're just going to get it over there, mark it up, and then sell it over here. So Trump is fundamentally, he's a capitalist, but I think even more than that, he's a patriot. And he loves the country, and he looks out for America's interests. And he's kind of not bashful about that. And that itself is a little bit of a shock. So I think Trump, in that sense, is redefining the Republican Party uh, and essentially considering trade itself as part of the political process, which, of course, it is. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Burka. The new book, I don't know when he sleeps because he publishes a new book every three weeks, is Blitz. Trump will smash the left and win. First, tell us, um, David, what what is what is the key to your optimism? Why are you so confident that in 136 well, days we're going to win? I, I I believe that well, this book I've written, Blitz, part of it is about how evil the Democrat Party has become, and part of it is about why Trump is able to survive the, 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 all these attacks. He's the most slandered human being in, in all in the history of the human race. And yet he's managed to prevail, um, mainly because he doesn't back down. <laughs> mainly because when when the racist left, you know, and the only serious racism in America is anti-white racism. Everybody can see that now. And I say that as somebody who marched in his first civil rights march in 1948, before, before any of these looters were born. Um, but Americans, first of all, they're not stupid. And they understand that the Democrats uh, are compulsive liars and hypocrites. Everybody can see that, that the coronavirus has been manipulated by the Democrat Party. It's always about uh, convicting Trump of crimes he didn't commit. You, you can't, you can't um, play in the park with your children. Um, or open a barber shop or a salon uh, because of the virus, but you can throw, you know, have tens of thousands of people in the streets rioting and burning things if they're doing it for the Democrat cause. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. America has been doing some soul searching lately. Perhaps you noticed. We're examining what's right with America and what can be made better. No other country does this kind of introspection better than us. Some of what we found we don't like and will change. Every life has the right to be treated with dignity and always came out stronger. We will this time too. Our hosts will make sure of that. We are the answer. America, bonjour, hi, Canada. Hugh Hewitt inside the Beltway on Wednesday, June the 24th in the year of the plague 2020. Joined by the Washington Examiner and Fox News, Byron York. You can follow Byron on Twitter at Byron York. Good morning, Byron. How are you? Good morning. You're doing well. Thank you. All right, both you and I wrote columns on the Tulsa rally that had the same bottom line. Um, it's going to be harder to get people to go indoors, shrug it off, Donald Trump, move on. Uh, I think that's what the president did in Arizona last night. Is that how you read Arizona? Yeah, exactly. Look, uh, I, I have to say, I, do, I told you so, but um, I did say long before this Tulsa rally, do it outside. People yep. are, first of all, the, the science tells us there's, uh, there's much less transmission outdoors, and people are nervous when they go indoors 
to uh, kind of a, a, a closely packed event indoors. And believe me, I covered a lot of Trump rallies. Um, they were crowded. They're obviously indoors. And they took a long time. You know, you're waiting in line a long time to get in. You go through a lot of security. Then you're there hours before the, the rally begins. And then at the end, that's when everybody's trying to leave at the same time, so they're all really crowded together. So people are nervous about that right now. And I, I, I think the results in Tulsa reflected that. Now, Byron, I think of Warren Mollenkopf Stadium, which is where every football game in Warren has been held for 50 years. And it can probably hold 10,000 people. And there's one of these municipal stadiums in every small town and city in, in, in America, right? There's one everywhere. Every, every high school, if you've got a high school football rivalry that's of any sort of significance, you'll find You don't have to go to the shoe. You don't have to go to the big house in Michigan. There are places to do outdoor rallies and people can turn it into kind of a festival. Has that sort of dawned on Team Trump now that that's the way to go? <clears throat> well, I think it has. <clears throat> Excuse me. Remember, one of Trump's biggest rallies that really kind of got him on the map was when he went to um, uh, Mobile, Alabama in 2015. Jeff Sessions was there with him and he was at a football stadium and it was huge. And, and uh, his, his plane, uh, Trump, the, the Trump plane kind of buzzed the uh, stadium. And it was a big, big deal. Outdoor rally. Yeah, that's the other thing I pointed out in my column. Viana, Ohio, and it is pronounced Viana in Ohio because we're from Ohio. Whenever he would land Air Force One at the Youngstown Warren Regional Airport, he'd just park it on the tarmac. They'd do a stage and 10,000 people would show up. I mean, he did these fly-ins everywhere. So I just think they got to go back to the playbook. Jason Miller is reported by Axios this morning to be back as the, quote, Trump whisperer. That bodes well for a campaign that needs some communications help. I think it needs communications help. What do you think, Byron York? Well, I, I mean, the, the problems in Tulsa were uh, not really communications problems. I mean, they were planning problems. They were sort of conceptual problems. They were failing to sort of think through what a, a big event should be like in this time of people still worried about coronavirus. So they weren't really uh, a, a big communications problem. I guess the communications problem came in when uh, when they talked about having a million people sign up for it. That was well, yeah. Really to me, it's all there. comms. That the whole picture is comms. I guess it's just definitional. I think the whole. Uh, the campaign structure needs to be more aware of how things are presented and that they are waiting to dunk on the president as they did all day long on CNN and MSNBC if he de if he underperforms. Oh yeah, the, listen, looking at Twitter that night of the uh, of the Tulsa rally, I mean the the glee, the glee, the joy, uh, the uh, the the lackluster turnout gave Trump's opponents in the media and the Democratic Party and everywhere, was just astonishing. And as a matter of fact, John Favreau, who was one of Barack Obama's um, speechwriters, said, look, is this, is this all this criticism of this crowd size, is it petty? And is it basically meaningless? Yes. But are we really enjoying it? Yes. You know, honesty, good for John Favreau. That's a unique thing. Let's turn to the Hill. There are two things happening. Testimony today and a vote on Tim Scott's bill. In reverse order, they're not going to pass Tim Scott's bill because it would be a win for an African-American Republican senator. So we're not going to get police reform because they don't want it to happen because they don't want Donald Trump to sign it. Byron, York, does the cynicism behind this get through to the electorate that the Democrats are blocking police reform? I think so. You know, what's interesting is um, um, a poll just the other day uh, showed, you know, it, um, it, uh, it, was, uh, it was on defund the police. Do you support defund the police? Majorities, of course, do not support defund the police. Uh, but then it talked about chokeholds. Do you support uh, banning them? And, of course, a large majority did support that. They, they actually support practical reforms. And I, I think one of the ways that the, the current protests are kind of off base with public opinion is that when the public sees some problem, um, they like the idea of fixing the problem. And so they support sort of targeted um, fixes to the problems that they're, they're seeing in, in the case of George Floyd, uh, the chokehold. And they support fixing that, but they don't support sort of blowing up entire all of American society. I think they're very discerning on 
on the crazy people who are screaming at the police obscenities and getting in. They know yeah. little clips of video. I think that just helps Donald Trump. Who is testifying today, Byron? Uh, a man named Aaron Zelensky, and the reason it's important, he's testifying for the House Judiciary Committee. The reason it's important, it's, it's the first time a Robert Mueller prosecutor has testified in Congress since Robert Mueller's disastrous appearance before Congress on uh, July uh, 24th, 2019. And the, the, the stated reason is that uh, Zelensky says that uh, he was pressured by higher-ups at the Justice Department to go easy on Roger Stone um, because Stone is an associate of the, pres of the president. And this is in the sentencing phase for Roger Stone. Remember, there was kind of a brouhaha about Stone's sentence. But uh, once you get Zelensky there and he's in the chair, uh, Republicans can ask about anything they want. They don't have to ask him about the story he wants to talk about. Uh, um, Zelensky handled, for example, the George Papadopoulos case. Lots of mystery about that. He can be asked about that. He can be asked all. What about things. the mysterious Professor Milsef, right? Uh, that that would be a good one. Did you attempt to find him? And you know, the the mysterious Professor yes. Milsef in the library with the candlestick. They ought to ask him. Did you try and find this guy? Ex exactly, exactly. And by the way, Democrats are going to try to make a big deal of this Roger Stone thing. And if you remember, the uh, Zelensky and the prosecutors. Uh, suggested a sentence of between 87 and 108 months. And the Justice Department said, you know, that's too much. That's just overcharging. They didn't name a specific sentence, but they said a more reasonable range would be between 37 and 46 months. Now, if you remember the actual sentence that was given to Roger Stone, it was 40 months, pretty much right where the Justice Department said. And so you have to ask yourself, well, what's the scandal here? I mean, you know what I would else Department. I would ask Byron if I'm Jim Jordan. I don't know if Jordan's on judiciary anymore. Uh, I don't think he, he is, is, but he Doug Collins. The judiciary committee now. Oh, yeah. No, I thought you had no House oversight. I would ask, how often did you see Mr. Mueller? How often did you interact with him? When was the last yep. time you saw him? Was he in control of the investigation? Did he appear to you to have declining health? Uh, did he appear to have any connection to James Comey? I, I, I wouldn't be dramatic. There, there is a tendency among the Republicans to ask too few questions instead of asking a lot of questions about specific issues that that yes. plague the Mueller investigation, Byron. In the end, my concern is he lost control of that investigation and partisans took it over. What's your assessment of that investigation? Well, actually, what you're seeing on the left is a lot of retrospective dissatisfaction with, with Mueller because they're, they're never going to give up the belief that there's a giant Russia conspiracy in there somewhere and that Donald Trump is guilty. So they feel that Mueller had too much institutional respect for the presidency and just, and just didn't do the investigation that he could have done. Now, clearly, um, the issue of Mueller's uh, abilities, uh, whether they had declined uh, was clearly an issue when he testified on July 24th, 2019. Uh, it was it was a really poor performance, and uh, he was not Robert Mueller that a lot of people remembered. People who had worked with Mueller after September 11th, when he was uh, the new head of the FBI, remembered a guy who was totally sharp, totally in command, a total micromanager, uh, and clearly that was not the Robert Mueller who testified in 2019. Uh, you could clearly ask. Zelensky questions about that. This is the deal. This is the first time a Mueller prosecutor has appeared before Congress. And the Democrats want to talk about one thing. If they want to talk about Roger Stone and somehow this sentence was, was unjust, fine. But Republicans get to ask whatever they want. They ought to ask about the mysterious Professor Milsef. That's my favorite unanswered <laughs> question. John Durham will find out. Byron York is always a pleasure. Follow Byron at Byron York on Twitter and follow him at the Washington Examiner on Fox News and follow me to the next segment, America, it's the Hugh Hewitt Show. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you in part by the Job Creators Network Foundation. Now on America First with Sebastian Gorka. 
the new book, I don't know when he sleeps because he publishes a new book every three weeks, is <laughs> Blitz. Trump will smash the left and win. First, tell us, um, David, what, what, is, what is the key to your optimism? Why are you so confident that in 136 well, days I, we're going to win? I, I, I believe that tr well, th this book I've written, Blitz, part of it is about how evil the Democrat Party has become. And part of it is about why Trump is able to survive the, 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 all these attacks. He's the most slandered human being in, in, all, in the history of the human race. And yet he's managed to prevail, um, mainly because he doesn't back down. <laughs> mainly because when when the racist left, you know, and the only serious racism in America is anti-white racism. Everybody can see that now. And I say that as somebody who marched in his first civil rights. You can't um, play in the park with your children. Um, or open a barber shop or a salon uh, because of the virus, but you can throw, you know, have tens of thousands of people in the streets rioting and burning things if they're doing it for the Democrat cause. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Dennis Prager Show. It may not have been the uh, the appropriate response to shoot the man who was running away with the taser. And I it meant to make sense to me. I want to make clear, though, to all listening, as much as a mistake as that might have been, and I have to emphasize might have, because that'll be adjudicated. I'm going to put it back in leaping to the notion that it was done because the man was black is a non sequitur to me. I just I just don't understand how people get to that conclusion. I agree. That's an absurdity. Uh, there's no way that that officer woke up that morning and said, I'm going to go and, and kill a black person today. That's just a ridiculous thing to say. In fact, where I work is in underserved neighborhoods of color. And the vast majority of cops there, I don't know vast, the majority of cops there are white, and we choose to work there because we want to help the community. We don't want to go there and hurt people in the community. We're there to help protect and serve that community. And I firmly believe that the vast majority of police officers, vast majority, wake up every morning wanting to do good and wanting to help. And those circumstances happen to be they shot a person who was black. They didn't shoot a person because he was black. Right. That's a ridiculous yes. statement, a ridiculous sentiment, and the people that perpetrate that, I think, are as guilty as anyone in this whole mess. I, yes, that's the reason I raised it, and every study that I have seen has confirmed that, including the National Academy of Sciences, speaking about the lack of racist bigotry in the police force. Last year, this report came out, ladies and gentlemen, National Academy of Sciences, that is the highest body of science in the United States of America. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. America has been doing some soul searching lately. Perhaps you noticed we're examining what's right with America and what can be made better. No other country does this kind of introspection better than us. Some of what we've found we don't like and will change. Every life has the right to be treated with dignity and respect. That includes our law enforcement as well as every skin color. We've been through this before in America. And we always came out stronger. We will this time too. Our hosts will make sure of that. We are the answer. Welcome back, America. It's Hugh Hewitt. Spotify summer song list is what the Fetching Mrs. Hewitt told me I should use for bump music, but I think I'm going to veto it because it's horrible. Uh, good morning to you. Let's check markets brought to you by Andrew and Todd.com. Andrew Del Rey, Todd Avakian, together there with Sierra Pacific. I tell you about them twice a day. Call them at 888 1172 If you're thinking about ever buying an investment property or a vacation property or helping your son or daughter, Become a homeowner by becoming a non-occupying co-borrower. 
Now is the time. The 10-year Treasury is still at 0.71%. I used to get all excited when it dropped below 2%. Actually, I used to get excited when it dropped below 3%. Now it's at 0.71%. I think that means interest rates in the, in the very low threes, maybe the high twos. You have to call Andrew and Todd to find out. But if you need money out of your house or you're a senior citizen and you want very, very much to get a little relief from a crimped budget and you're sitting on a bunch of equity and you never want to make a mortgage payment again, that's a reverse mortgage. It allows you to take all that money out, but it doesn't let you take all the money out because they don't want you to pay a mortgage payment. So you never make another mortgage payment in your life. You get the equity. Andrew and Todd.com have a bunch of financial advisors they can recommend to you no matter where you are in the country, but you have to call them first. 888 there with Sierra Pacific. Uh, the markets yesterday, the Dow was up 131, the NASDAQ was up 74, and the S&P was up 13. The NASDAQ is now at 10,131. How long can that go on? How long can NASDAQ continue to lead the way? Well, yesterday, Amazon went up $50.59, or 1.86%. And that's because of the disintermediation of old retail and I think people are intuiting, we're not going back to the mall anytime soon. And Amazon's going to be the beneficiary of that. Uh, I, I expect another big day for Amazon because of the early trading in Amazon. It's a morning, so you never know how the afternoon will be. But I just think everybody in the world is pushing their money into Costco and Target and Walmart and Amazon and anyone who delivers. And we're all becoming very proficient. Even me, I hate to do online shopping. I hate it uh because i don't know how to work the various things that you have to pick but the fetching mrs hewitt is good at it so i have to buy a new camera stand for example i'm looking at you right now if you're watching on the youtube stream that's standing on top of a court cardboard box because behind it is a uh a display stand on which to put the camera box but it requires some assembly the most dreaded words in the world requires some assembly. I've hated them since my kids were three. Requires some assembly means my whole day is shot. But I will work to get it done. It arrived, you know, just stuff shows up at your house now because the world comes to you thanks to Amazon. And that's, that's the reality. And in the meantime, the housing market has taken off again. Buyers are back. It's a seller's market in some places, a buyer market in other. Go to andrewandtodd.com to find out. You'll also find over at uhewitt.com an advertisement uh, click for Larry Elder's new movie. Now, if you don't know Larry, uh, you don't know broadcasting. He's been this almost as long as I have. I've been doing this since 1990. I don't know when Larry began. He's also a University of Michigan Law School grad. The big difference between Larry and I, he's Cleveland. He's a Browns fan. Uh, the big difference between Larry and I, of course, is he's black and I'm not. And Larry has made a movie called Uncle Tom. <clears throat> in which he got every major black conservative in America to talk about what it's like to be yeah, an African-American African. black conservative. That's, That's redundant. redundant. <clears throat> Excuse me, in America. And Uncle Tom is over at uhewitt.com. Use my name, Hugh, if you want a discount. And it's gotten great reviews. It's 106 minutes long, very powerful uh, When Joe Biden said, if you don't vote for Biden, you ain't black, that's clearly not true. And if you want to prove it to someone, send them the link to Larry Elder's new movie, Uncle Tom. And you cannot miss it over at HughHewitt.com. Also, I want to remind everyone, if you like the Heritage Foundation yesterday, HughForHeritage.com. HughForHeritage.com to get all the interviews we did yesterday and the Guide to Socialism. And please don't forget, FlattenTheFear.com. All right, my voice broke. Allergies. FlattenTheFear.com. That's where the Job Creators Network has put all the data on COVID that you need to have. FlattenTheFear.com. Stay tuned, America. I'll be right back on The Hugh Hewitt Show. Trending now on The Mike Gallagher Show. The virus isn't red or blue. But the left immediately weaponized it against President Trump, their endless efforts to remove him having failed from the beginning of the scourge. It was obvious they were more interested in demonizing Trump than in defeating the virus.
Though Trump and virtually all of America condemned the senseless killing of George Floyd, the extreme left seized the moment, not merely to protest officer misconduct, but to condemn the nation for systemic racism, white privilege, and white supremacy. Leftist activists converted the protests into riots, looting, violence. Democrat leaders refused to condemn it. Instead, they fanned the flames lit by the organized mob. They've joined the movement to topple monuments and erase all other unpleasant aspects of American history as if they never occurred. But see, David Limbaugh says, there's nothing, this is nothing new for the Democrats. Nothing new for the Democratic Party. It was shocking that its key figures dared to publicly support some of the certifiably insane provisions of the Green New Deal. It was surreal that some of their leading presidential candidates openly supported the abolition of the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement. But the widespread move to defund the police now takes the insanity to French Revolution crazy levels. How can parents not fear for their children's future? How can an entire political party give itself over to a lawless mob? How can it condone the systemic suppression of political speech by Hollywood, the corporate left, and social media giants? Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Larry Elder Show. Dr. Strom, I just did a video about the Hong Kong flu of 1968. And if you look at the number of people who contracted it and died and adjusted for a population, it was about 150,000 Americans. Uh, that's about uh, 20, about 38,000 uh, fewer deaths than we have uh, so far with the current coronavirus. And we didn't shut down the government. I don't even remember it. I was 16 years old. I don't even remember anybody talking about it at the time. Okay. A point well taken. Let's just look at the numbers now. So since since the the May 16th, okay, we're having new cases, clearly. And, okay, businesses are opening up and people are getting more liberal. They're not, they're not as worried about transmission. But in the last week, I mean, there's going to be 709 new deaths, so 29,000 new cases. Mm -hmm. And last weekend was the highest daily total since May 16th, okay? But if somebody gets a disease, is that a death sentence? Probably not. We see the mortality is probably less than we thought. So transmission is going to happen, and maybe we do want that, because I told you last time I was on about herd immunity. Mm -hmm. You get 50 to 70 percent of the population infected. Yes, you, sir, sure am. I see Kerry B. And, uh, Strom, and we may need doctor. that herd immunity if we don't get a vaccination within the next, what, year? We hope by year end. So, yes, there are new cases. Perfect. Does it warrant a complete shutdown? Probably not. Okay, thank you, sir. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Eric Metaxas Show. Hey there, folks. Welcome. I'm talking to my friend Dinesh D'Souza. He has a new book out today. It's called United States of Socialism. If previous presidents had done the right thing, uh, the monster that is now China uh, would not be as big as it is, and it we would not have to deal with it in this way. But it seems to me that the, the naivete uh, and the greed um, of, of Clinton and, and the Bushes with regard to China, thinking that you know, the, 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 the God of the free market is going to solve the political problems in China and make them just like us. You know, that's one kind of stupidity. The other is just the pure greed of, of saying that, knowing that at least whatever happens, I'm going to make a lot of money. We've let this go on for 30 plus years. And, and it seems that you need someone like Trump uh, to deal with them in the way that he's been dealing with them. At least that's what I think. The Chinese have had a longstanding policy of getting favorable treatment from the leaders of other countries by financing their family members. It's an old kind of Asian despotic um, mode of doing business. Now, if you look at Biden, for example, over the years, Biden's net worth has not gone up uh, for the simple reason that he has to disclose That's any it. investments that he has, any deals that he makes. 
But now watch the Biden family, his brother, James Biden, uh, his other brother, Frank Biden, his son, Hunter Biden. When Biden goes to China, he takes Hunter Biden. Hunter Biden then gets a deal through the Shanghai free trade zone that is not available to Western investors in which the Chinese government itself is putting in money, a $1.5 billion investment. So Keep up with what's trending. Welcome back, America. You are joined now by Admiral James Stavridis. He's down in Florida. Good morning, Admiral. Thank you, and welcome back to the Hugh Hewitt Show. Good to see you, Hugh. Good to see you. Now, Admiral, I would like to talk to you a little bit about um, a conversation I had yesterday with former Secretary of Defense Robert Gates. My guess is you're a fan of his. Oh, 100%. Uh, of all the bosses I've had, I would put him at the very top of the list, Hugh. He's just terrific. That's a pretty high praise. Why? Um, I'll give you three reasons. One, he is calm. He never loses his temper. He never blows up. And this is a guy who ran the CIA, was Secretary of Defense, both for uh, Bush and Obama. Think about that for a minute. Only time in history someone's made that turn between two parties to still be a Secretary of Defense. Yet he's always calm in the saddle. Number two, great sense of humor. Uh, funny, clever, can use humor to diffuse a situation. And number three, he's got that spy master's gaze. Um, you know, former head of the CIA, deeply perceptive, deeply intelligent, has a PhD in Russian studies. He's the whole package, Hugh. So yesterday I talked to him at length in this kind of a in, a, in a setting where I was talking to him on Skype and, and going between two microphones. So I'm sorry I'm not looking at you sometimes, Admiral. And he said something that was arresting. He said, um, we are in Cold War 2.0 and that this one is more dangerous than the last one. Now, Bob Gates is the first person I've had who's been willing to say that. Uh, and I think he probably commands more Venn diagram respect, meaning between Democrats and Republicans, he's the guy that gets the most respect from both of them. Uh, what do you make of his willingness to go there? Uh, well, first of all, I assume you were talking to him about his new book, which is uh, yes. very, very good. It's about the use of American power in the world. Uh, I, you know, disclosure, I just did a book review of it for oh. a, a magazine. Uh, I'm a big fan of the book. He kind of lays the tracks out uh, for that in the book. Um, on this one, though, I, I'm going to part company with the secretary. I think we're very close to Cold War 2.0. Uh, but here, I'm going to go with the deeply specialized knowledge on China of Henry Kissinger. And Kissinger has said, I think it's a good line, that we're in the foothills of a Cold War with China. We're at the very beginning. So maybe we're just splitting hairs here. I think we're probably still in a position to avoid plunging into a full-blown Cold War. And I'll close with this. Let's look back at what Cold War 1.0 looked like before we say we're in 2.0. 1.0 was hair trigger on the nuclear devices. 1.0 was millions of troops facing down across the Fulda Gap in Europe. Uh, 1.0 was two massive alliance systems lined up against each other, Warsaw Pact and NATO. And 1.0 was a, a world structure where there was almost no dialogue, no conversation uh, between the US and the Soviet Union. I don't think we're hitting all of those blocks yet, but we're close. There is a new emerging alliance structure, which brings me to the second story. This happened on June 4, and I didn't have a chance to talk with you yet about it. I want to read to you. India and Australia signed two bilateral military agreements on June 4th in, quote, the first step in deepening of defense relationship between the two Indo-Pacific powers. All right. Now, most people don't talk Australia and India at the same time, uh, but they are now linking up. What's the significance sure. of that and how exactly do you link up if you're Australia, which is, you know, half a world away from anywhere? Well, if you look at that globe over my right shoulder, you'll see the Indian Ocean. And I often put that behind me when I'm speaking because I think the 21st century ocean that will matter the most 
may be the Indian Ocean by the latter part of the 21st century because of India, because of its confluence, and because it's a relatively untouched body of water. So how do they link up? First of all, look at the geography. They have a maritime corridor that connects them that's quite significant. Secondly, what motivates them to come together is their shared concern over China. And look at what's happened just last week, Hugh. Um, major uh, conflict at the top of the Himalaya mountains between China and uh, India. And let me tell you something, that's not about the Himalayas per se. That's really about a global competition that at the moment is uh, parked in that Indian Ocean region. And to finish this, you know, China's strategy, as you well know, is called One Belt, One Road. Well, One Belt, One Road has one big problem, and it's one big problem is India. The geography is such that China will want to dominate or at least control India in this 21st century. Therefore, the Indians are shopping for allies. It's not only Australia, it's Japan and the United States. That's the building coalition. Well, I love having the globe there, and thank you for having it there, Admiral, because people can, if they, if you go back to the large shot pen so we can get the globe in it. Uh, Australia, you can sail from Australia to India, but you got to go around Malaysia and Indonesia and all that different part. When India gets into a shooting match with China at the top of the world, which they did, a number of Indian soldiers were killed. What is Australia obliged to do anything, or is it one of those uh, defense packs where we're just going to do some exercises together? Is it the beginning of a NATO in the Pacific, or is it really symbolic? Boy, that's a, a big question that I think will unfold over the next decade or two, the idea of a collective alliance system in the Pacific. And of course, an alliance is where when one is attacked, it is an attack on all, the famous Article 5 in NATO. That does not exist yet. Uh, India does not have a treaty alliance with Australia. The United States does. The United States has treaty alliances with Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, the Philippines, Thailand. So there's the basics for a collective security pact over time, could that evolve into a kind of Pacific NATO? Maybe. And certainly it would be an Indo, as in Indian Ocean, Indo-Pacific NATO, because you would have to bring India into it. A final thought here, in the Indian Ocean uh, last spring, big maritime exercise between uh, India, Australia, Japan, and the United States. Um, this is the wave, not to make a pun, uh, this is the wave of the future. It'll start as a maritime kind of alignment, I think, you. No, no, I don't say reason. When we say the Indian military, what are we talking about in terms of capacity? The Australian military has always punched above its weight for more than a century, part of the Imperial British uh, forces and a storied history. What about the Indian military? Uh, the Indian military, first thing to know is it is a nuclear power. Um, it has high levels of professionalism. Um, I've operated with them. I, I know the Indian military reasonably well. Uh, their naval component is uh, credible. They are certainly not at the level of China as yet. I would put them as a uh, mid-level naval power with a uh, room to grow. And they are uh, doing this both in a smart way, both by producing uh, ships indigenously in India, but also uh, shopping the international markets. India is a comer in the world of defense. Australia is a small diamond of a country that does exceptional work. And, and I do some consulting for Northrop Grumman. We're involved in Australia, so I have good visibility into the Australian military, utterly professional, highly capable, keenly aware of the challenges of a growing Chinese military parked on their doorstep. Again, look at that globe. Um, Australia is small and perfect. India is bigger, but growing and getting better. It's a pretty natural alignment to, uh, to use the Jerry Maguire line. They kind of complete each other militarily. I could see a lot of upside in that relationship. Okay, so last question, Admiral. There is this thing called the Five Eyes Agreement, which exists between Canada, New England, Australia, the United Kingdom, and America, the English-speaking countries, and we cooperate on intelligence. 
Do you foresee Japan and or India joining Five Eyes? Um, we are constantly looking at Five Eyes and thinking about who would be the logical nation or nations to bring into that super high level of intelligence. And you'll get different answers from different professionals. I'd be curious when I conclude, if you ask Bob Gates this question, who of course really knows Intel, I would say looking at the five eyes, the next nation I would think about bringing in may surprise you, but it would be Israel, which has terrific intelligence capability, obviously long history in this area, very, very good. I think you'd also look at Japan as, as the next. And the logic there is um, both of them bring whole new components from regions where the U.S. could really benefit. Longer term, I think you look at some of our European allies, particularly uh, the French and the Germans, potentially over time. And I think uh, India, yes, at some point you would want to bring it in. I'll close by saying it's interesting to observe that the Five Eyes is, as you say, the English speaking uh, collection it came out of the Commonwealth relationships coming came, coming out of Great Britain. So there's a certain logic to India in that one as well. Long there there is, but but you know, in Pakistan they have the corruption problem with the ISI. I do not know anything about Indian intelligence. Do you, Admiral? Do you have an opinion of it? I would not leap to join with them at the moment for the corruption issues and the nuance issues and the the loss of intelligence. I think the the counterintelligence forces arrayed against India are significant coming from China. So I think you'd have to be very careful. That's why I put them further out in the orbit than I would, for example. Uh, you froze up on us there, Admiral, a little bit. Okay. Uh, gla oh, quick last question. How often have you been to a India, Admiral? I've been there half a dozen times over the years, Hugh, which for me is not a huge number of times. Uh, each visit, I come away more impressed with the trajectory. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, you're freezing up on democracy. And they yeah. care, they're young, they're a democracy, and they care deeply about uh, values. So I, I think India is a nation to watch and a potential significant ally for the United States over time. You know, one of the things that people say, the only thing you can create by virtue of having population is data, but data is actually a natural resource. Now, India can produce as much data as China if they choose to use it, data powering artificial intelligence. But that requires a kind of uh, comprehensive cooperation that we've never had with India. Uh, in, uh, United Kingdom does. But do you see that in our military, a willingness to lean into the Indian relationship? I think over time, the potential for uh, that kind of cooperation is there with India. But let's face it, we're, we're on the beach at Kitty Hawk in terms of where we are with uh, artificial intelligence, data. Uh, you're correct, data is regarded as the new oil. The more you have, you can drive artificial intelligence, therefore machine learning in real time, crucial. We uh, still regard that as crown jewel material. We're going to hold that very closely, would be better served cooperating, for example, with the United Kingdom on that rather than moving toward India at this point. Admiral James Stavridis, always a pleasure. Follow him on Twitter at Stavridis Jago or to his website, Admiral, AdmiralStav.com, and you'll get all that Admiral Stavridis writes. Thank you, Admiral. Time to remind you folks. Don't leave home without it. ReliefFactor.com sponsors the show, sponsors us every single day, and you want to make sure that you take it. Take it with you, relieffactor.com. I took it in the first hour. I remind you about hour two, but I also remind you about Honor Bound Coffee. That's the subscription coffee service that once you're in, you'll get your coffee delivered to your door, just like most people want their groceries delivered in the age of the virus. But you'll also get a product, every penny of the profit from which goes to benefit military families across the United States. Head out right now to honorboundcoffee.com and come right back to the Hugh Hewitt Show. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Gorka. We used to be able to testify in court and we were believed. Now, unless there is a video from three different angles, no one cares what you have to say. With all this talk about racism and racist cops, I've never seen people treated differently because of their race. 
And while I know that cowards that have never done this job will call me a racist for saying it, all I've ever seen was criminal behavior and cops trying to stop it. And they didn't give a rip what their skin color was. I've seen cops help and save any type of race, gender, or ethnicity you can think of. And while that used to mean something, no one cares anymore. I've been called every name you can think of, and many of them with racial overtones, and it's never come from cops. I've watched African-American cops take the brunt of this and even talked one rookie out of quitting after he was berated by a lot of cowards that had the same skin color as him. I've never heard. I've heard words I never heard before coming a cop. Uncle Tom, Cracker, Pig, and the N-Word, just to name a few. I've heard them thousands of times, and never once did I see an officer retaliate. They just took it. A nasty, the nasty words have now turned into rocks and bottles and gunfire. I've watched it happen to those around me, and I've seen the total destruction of their life. This job is a walking time bomb and you can get canceled or prosecuted on the very next call, even if you do everything right. No profession has to deal with that. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Welcome back, America. Hugh Hewitt, joined now by Peter Baker of the New York Times on this Wednesday morning. Good morning, Peter. How are you? Hey, good morning. How are you? Good. The president went down to Arizona yesterday. Did you travel with him, or were you part of the team that stayed behind? No, I did not. We, were, uh, we weren't on the plane, I don't think. All right. So uh, what is the mood inside the White House after uh, the Tulsa rally, disappointed in terms of live audience, maybe overperformed in terms of viewing audience? Yeah, look, it's a sour moment, obviously. It hasn't been a good couple of weeks for the campaign. There's a lot of backbiting and, and you know, finger-pointing and how this went wrong, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's, not, a, it's not a great moment. It, it is still June, of course, and I think, uh, you know, any, any, any veterans of campaigns certainly can remember times when uh, things look bad in summer and look better in the fall, so they're trying to hold on to, to, to the faith that uh, things are going to turn around uh, for them, but you know, it's it's not been a happy uh, couple of weeks. The latest poll are, that my paper has out this morning, I think, shows a 14 point deficit. Uh, and so, you know, they don't subscribe to all these polls, and they have their own polling. But even their own polling shows some, some real trouble spots and some real worrying signs. Now, the CNBC polling is the the best that I've seen for Trump. I, your poll, the New York Times, is registered voters, which. I honestly have never understood why anyone runs registered voters because that doesn't mean anything, but it's registered voters. I look at the, the battleground states and I see Florida is up for Biden by seven in the CNBC poll. That is surprising to me, given Ron DeSantis's popularity. So the president's going to have to spend more time down there. 
have they decided they're going outdoors, which is the most common sense? I don't know why anyone would go indoors, Peter. People don't want to be indoors. Yeah, they don't want to. Obviously, Jacksonville would be a good place to do an outdoor kind of event this summer. I haven't heard uh, of, a, of a decision on that. Uh, it, they're going to have to you know, address this, this concern on the part of, of, of their own voters. Their own voters want to support. President Trump, obviously, but they're nervous like anybody else that we haven't conquered this, uh, this coronavirus and that large gatherings are still uh, problematic. So we'll, we'll see how, that, how, they, how they reorganize that if they do. Um, but you're right, Florida is in play now, and that's one reason why the president decided to move the part of the convention down there. Uh, Arizona uh, is obviously in play, which is why he was there yesterday. States that we didn't think were necessarily going to be critical um, are more, more competitive now. That widens the battleground, and it will uh, it will make for a more interesting race, I think, for a lot of us than just going to Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan over and over. Oh, and I think Minnesota's in play now, too, for Team Trump. I don't know where New Hampshire has gone in the course of this, but I think Minnesota is definitely headed towards Trump land. Tell me a little bit, Peter, about the, uh, the campaign hierarchy. You know, we went through uh, Corey Lewandowski to Paul Manafort uh, in the blink of an eye because... Ivanka and Jared were not happy in 2016. Is Brad Parscale in um, uh, a secure position? Well, look, you know, Brad Parscale, Brad Parscale, the campaign manager, said the other day, he says, look, I've been fired 85 weeks in a row. His, uh, his fate has been speculated on so many times. I think he's trying to, uh, to just brush it off. But you can't be secure, I think, in the Trump organization. We've seen uh, you know, again and again, that he's willing to, to make changes when he feels frustrated by things. And, and Parscale is the top guy, you know, is, is under a lot of heat right now. It doesn't necessarily mean that the, the president will switch, switch uh, teams. He did send Hogan Gidley over yesterday from the White House to take over as the campaign's main spokesman. Uh, we may see more changes to come. It's, it's never, you know, I mean, Mick Mulvaney used to say this when he was acting chief of staff. He says, look, we're all acting. Uh, you know, uh, in his jobs, and you know, the president will make changes when he makes changes. I miss the uh, dispatch of Hogan. What was that? What was the explanation for that given? Well, look, you know, I think he uh, didn't get the press secretary job. Went to uh, to uh, uh, McEnany, of course, and so in effect, he's now uh, going over to the campaign to take the slot that she had had as the as the national campaign. Uh, press secretary, somebody who will be, you know, uh, the face of the campaign on on a lot of these TV shows and a lot of the uh, in a lot of the media. So, you know, I think they're 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 it's a it's a two for them. I mean, she's getting uh, Kaylee getting her office set uh, for her with her deputies and people that she wants to work with, and and I think uh, that uh, Hogan Gibley goes over to the campaign where he uh, has a chance to 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 play a role in this you know remarkable 130 days we have ahead of us, or 120 some days ahead of us. Uh, Peter, what's interesting is yesterday the president had four media availables. Uh, Brian Kilmeade in the Oval in the Rose Garden. Then he did a uh, a walk to the helicopter. Then he did the the Border Patrol uh, speech with Doug Ducey. Then he did the Charlie Kirk turning point. That's four avails in a day. That's what he did in 2016. Is that what you're expecting going forward? Oh yeah, look, he enjoys it. Obviously, he wants to get out there and talk. He wants to give his uh, get his position out. I think for for President Trump, the the, the key at the moment at least seems to be trying to turn it from a referendum on him into a choice between him and Biden. Right? He wants to flush Biden out of the basement. He wants to make it. Uh, uh, you know, he wants to do what Obama did to Romney in 2012 and what Bush did to Kerry in 2004 and say, look, whatever you think of me, the alternative is unacceptable. Biden, ironically, because of the coronavirus, has had uh, sort of a, uh, a few months of, uh, uh, you know, lower profile, which is, ironically has worked to his benefit probably because it hasn't been that choice. That will change at some point. You presume they'll be on stage three times this fall together, that the, the voters will be presented. You have this person and that person, and Trump will do what he can to make Biden unacceptable. Uh, but right now he's starting from a down uh, a down position. It remains, in my view, the economy, the economy, the economy. Tell me how that's doing. I'll tell you if he's going to win re-election. Peter Baker, always a pleasure. Don't go anywhere, America. Hour number three of the Hugh Hewitt Show, straight ahead. This is Lon He Chen of the Hoover Institution for townhall.com. Public health officials across America have spent the last several months warning about the dangers of the coronavirus and the need for us to stay at home, 
halt economic activity, and avoid social interactions with our friends and neighbors. We are now reopening our economy in many parts of the country, but these same public health officials have compromised their own credibility as we do so. On the one hand, they've urged caution and a slow return to work, school, and faith gatherings. They've criticized those who oppose the stay-at-home orders. But at the same time, these officials have been broadly supportive of the large protests on America's streets in the last few weeks. Public health officials should be helping us understand the comparative risks of activities, not endorsing the causes they like while prohibiting the ones they don't. Their hypocrisy is costly indeed. They have impacted our ability to address future health yes. crises. I'm Lan He Chen. ADF, fighting for those whose liberties are being violated. Attention business owners, as America gets back to work, will customers know you're there? With little warning, the coronavirus attacked our nation and our well-being in ways we never anticipated. The tragic loss of life, unprecedented economic upheaval, and a shattered sense of security has left many individuals and businesses in shambles. While the aftershocks could be felt for months to come, they may not have to. There is hope for an extraordinary turnaround of your bottom line. But will you be prepared for America's grand reopening? All signs point to the biggest business opportunity of our lifetime, coming as early as this summer. A recent survey of local advertisers shows a 10-point jump in the number of local advertisers who plan to maintain or increase their spending. One in four businesses expect to spend more in advertising by the end of June, and more than half expect to restart or surge their spending by this summer. As the numbers forecast increased spending from advertisers across the country, will your message be seen and heard? Will your business benefit from the pent-up consumer demand? Salem Surround is prepared to help you deliver the right advertising message to reach all potential customers wherever they are. Your business can be ready for a post-COVID-19 economy, but the time to act is now. Be at the front of the line as our economy begins to fire on all cylinders once again. For a free assessment of your marketing message and strategy, visit SalemSurround.com or contact your local media strategist today. Trending now on The Dennis Prager Show. You learn a lot on a construction site. You really learn yes. everything you need to know on a construction site. It's all there. And, uh, and when you go through that and you see how that works physically, it, it's helpful. It, it, it gives you a sort of clarity. Let me ask you a question. I just want to say to the public, he has two really wonderful children. I, I, they, are, they are kind, mature well-mannered they're really wonderful kids are they being affected forget the covid uh, lockdown are they being affected by the rioting and and the turbulence well they're being affected they're not being affected by what's going on in the streets but they're definitely being affected by the political climate um they graduated the eighth grade they have a, they have to put their statement, you know, a song lyric or a cliche or string some words together under their picture. My son is a little bit of a rebel. And he said, he announced at the table, he was going to put make America great again under his picture. My daughter said, no, you no, you're not because you won't be able to show up at school on the ninth grade. I don't want to be, I'm going to be chased around with a stick for my entire high school career. Oh, God. Let's think about that. You're doing such a good job. <laughs> Folks, this is, a, <laughs> he's terrific. Watch us in, uh, in No Safe Spaces and get his book. I'm your emotional support animal, Adam Carolla. Even though you're a lefty, we have a lot in common. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Mike Gallagher Show. I think the New York media is describing Florida as coronavirus raging through the state. That's literally the word they're using, at least in the New York Post. But there's a peculiar there's a peculiarity about these these uh, data driven news reports. 
all the bo- always at the bottom of the article, at the end of the report, they admit that deaths and hospitalizations are down and hospital capacity is nowhere near being stretched thin. I, I don't understand it any more than I can make sense of a of a guy like Anthony Fauci who told us that masks don't work and they're not effective and you shouldn't go around wearing a mask. You're causing more problems than than solutions. And then admitting that w- those were lies because they were worried that we would, you know, scarf up all the face masks from the hospital workers. And now, if you live in California, soon to be Texas, Tampa, Florida, you don't wear a mask. I guess you're breaking the law. I don't know what they're going to do to you if you don't have a mask. Think there'll be a mask jail? Will there be a prison for people who refuse to wear a mask? I'm serious. They're going to lock people up? You're just going to give you a fine? You're going to pay a fine if you refuse to wear a mask? I saw a, a conservative activist got kicked off a flight. He was trying to get to Tulsa. Uh, on an airplane, they kicked him off the plane. I believe it was American Air- American Airlines. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Eric Metaxas Show. Charlie Kirk, uh, Turning Point USA, Falkirk Center, Liberty University. Let's talk about um, what? college campuses in America? Because Turning Point USA, you do a lot of speaking uh, at college mm-hmm. campuses because they are the places really that they're they're the incubators of the woke uh, yeah. madness, I mean, the cultural Marxism. So I want everyone to lo- watch the news very carefully the next six months. When you see outward radicalism, hatred of our country, statements by Joe Biden or by leading Democrats that make your skin crawl, I want everyone listening to this to take a step back and ask, where did this come from? And it came from the universities. These ideas were given merit and basis through higher education and college campuses, through an intelligentsia of left-wing Marxist radicals that have been given undeserved credibility for absolute garbage, foolish ideas. For everyone listening to this, if you are worried about this, the, the continual decline of America into chaos or into our anarchy or, or the, the continu- as America's continue to trend, I want you to ask yourself the question, am I actually supporting it without even realizing it? Because I know a lot of your listeners, Eric, they say, oh, no, 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 I, I don't support the downfall of America. I'm very careful where I shop and wh- what I do and where I go to church. Maybe if you send your kid to a college, I'm not saying it's the right thing or the wrong thing. But you very well might be financially assisting the greatest threat to the future of America. And if you're voluntarily donating money as an alumni, you're absolutely doing that. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Glory, America, bonjour, hi, Canada. Hugh Hewitt on this Wednesday, June 23rd in the year of the plague 2020, joined by Washington Post reporter Bob Costa. Robert is also the host of Washington Week in Review, which you can watch every Friday night on your local PBS channel. Good morning, Bob. How are you? Good to be with you. Uh, The Trump rallies in red state America, you wrote on June 20th, and faces a sea of empty blue seats. I wrote the same column for the Post. Uh, large audience watching on television online, small audience in the auditorium. Did the message register with Team Trump? They're going to have to stay outside if they're going to want big crowds. Well, it was the beginning of the summer campaign for President Trump. And, and for him, it's not just about the rallies at this point. It's also about underscoring his core issues at every turn. And you saw him yesterday in Phoenix and in Arizona 
talking to young conservative voters, the turning point voters. You saw him visiting the border wall. So part of it's going to rallies uh, in places like Tulsa, Red State, and they're going to rethink maybe having arenas being the only venue. But it's also about having official events that also speak to those core voters. Well, the, the arenas just are not going to work in the age of COVID. I've talked to enough people who are my age and those who are certainly older. I'm 64, but if you talk to 75-year-old people, they ain't going out, Robert. And if, uh, if you're over 50, you might have a little bit of hesitation. People your age are going to go out and about, and they're not going to be deterred. So I think the president's got to go back to that that venerable institution of middle America, which is the high school football stadium, which can hold 10,000 people. At least it can in Maslin and, and places in Philadelphia. I'm sure they've got a few venues around Philadelphia, your home stomping ground, that can hold 10,000 people outdoors. Am I correct? I think high school football uh, fields are certainly going to be part of the mix. The other thing I keep hearing about is airplane hangars and airplane tarmacs because they're open air and you're able to have an airport security system already be in place. So it's a lot more easy. It's a lot easier for Secret Service to kind of handle an airport uh, in the way that the Air Force One can fly in, have the event, and then fly right back out. And the president's enjoyed them before having those kind of events. Uh, it's going to be difficult, though, you're right, for these arena rallies. I've spoken to my sources in the Trump campaign, just like you spoke to your sources, and I keep hearing that it, it's not so much about fear of protests, so that certainly may be the case for some voters. It really is, as you said, about health concerns. Older voters uh, especially don't want to risk their own health. It has nothing to do with whether they, they like President Trump or not. You know, uh, Robert, I don't know if you ever attend any of the Vienna, Ohio airport rallies. There were at least two in 2016. That's my home. That's my backyard, Trumbull County, Mahoning. It's called the Youngstown Warren Airport. It's the Air National Guard Reserve Station as well. He would fly in on the Trump campaign plane. He would be there less than an hour. Uh, thousands of people would show up. They'd ring the thing. He'd do his speech. The microphone was good, and he'd be gone. That was the quintessential Trump uh, uh, campaign motif in 2016. He did like indoor rallies because of the noise, but you're not going to fill those stadiums. I just don't think that's going to happen. Has that realization dawned on Brad Parscale yet? It's dawned on him, and he, he's kept his job. There were talk in political circles that maybe he'd be at risk but politically by not having that arena full, but he's trusted by the Trump family. Part of the Parscale magic politically is that he's close to Donald Trump Jr., he's close to Jared Kushner, so he's not just some operative who's out there on a limb. He's built these relationships with the Trump family that have kept him pretty rooted in, 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 his, in his current job, based on my own reporting. So, so when you, you talk, talk campaign, campaign, you talk, talk Trump. Trump. In, 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 in the, the days, days of W, it was, what does Rove think? Who matters in the calculation of themes, events, and travel plans on Team Trump? What they're trying to do is they're trying to show the Biden campaign that this is a, a choice election, that this is not just a referendum on President Trump. And that's a huge part of having these rallies is testing out lines, bringing out the Biden campaign, because there's a fear, or at least an anxiety in some areas of President Trump's circle, that President, Vice President Biden is not getting enough attention, and they need to go at him more. And so it's not just about rallying the voters, it's about making sure that Biden's getting scrutiny, and that they're bringing out uh, some of his vulnerabilities from their perspective. This is a reporting question, not about your opinion, Robert, but about the opinion inside Team Trump. Do they believe that Vice President Biden is in physical decline? Well, they, they continue to make this case publicly, not whether they think it or not. They're saying it. And they believe it based on their own advertisements. I mean, they're going after his health at, at every, every day. Um, but it's partly a response to the president's own concern about questions about his own health. And the president publicly continues to talk about his health, the West Point speech. The whole ramp. I don't need to tell you the whole story. You've seen it, and so it's these this, these two men in their seventies competing for who's more uh, strong and who's more youthful. Well, I thought the president's best line at the Tulsa rally was about the West Point ramp. I thought that was funny, and it was a little bit of the old Trump. I mean, every person who goes back on the road has to get their rhythm back, and I think Trump is doing that. But Joe Biden's in the basement now. This is a bigger question. Can you run a campaign from a basement for the entire campaign, Bob Costa? 
Biden's ahead of the polls, and his campaign sees his strategy right now is effective, but eventually things are going to change. And Joe Biden's never been a rally politician, and the question is, can he continue to hold his, his lead in the swing states in the Midwest by just kind of having a message of normalcy and a different tone than President Trump? And for now, it's working, but you're right. I mean, President Trump's a relentless political fighter. And he's going to try to define Biden. And at some point, Biden's ability to kind of stay under the radar is going to be challenged by a president who wants to define him. Yeah, I don't know if you noticed this yesterday. He did four media avails. Brian Kilmeade, the uh, police, uh, the uh, Border Patrol speech, the Charlie Kirk speech, and then a walk to the helicopter. Joe Biden did not. Uh, if you do that every day, what's the message that that sends? It's a message that's, that this is a campaign that uh, is not competing as hard as, it, as, hard as its own opponent. And it, but look, Biden's been a political veteran for a long time. He's eventually going to come out and punch back. And that's why these debates matter. And the president feels pretty good about these debates. That's why he's asked for another one. They're, they're scheduled to have three. The president wants four, maybe even more. My alma mater, my law school alma mater, canceled. They, they the University of Michigan does not want. I saw that. Yeah, well, that's because they're cowards. They, um, the Ohio State beats them up so much, they don't want to come out. I, I understand that completely. But uh, in terms of the number of debates, I also saw the Biden campaign saying, three, that's it, no more. And they also we're going to play by the Presidential Debate Commission rules, which I don't think Trump's going to accept. I still think we're in a position where we may not have any debates, Robert. It'd be hard for me to, not, to see, see how you don't have debates. I mean, at some point, the president may want to play by his own rules, but he needs to have the debates with Biden. I mean... His his people tell me that they need to have Trump going after him on stage, and if that doesn't happen through the Commission on Presidential Debate, it's hard to see Vice President Biden agree to another forum. Uh, well, that would mean Biden would not debate the Commander in Chief. He'd be in the basement. I, I you know, uh, sometimes you don't see it coming until it happens. But I think it's a giant trap for Joe Biden if he does not agree to for a debate. I, I I actually think this is. This is what they're planning on on Team Trump is no debate. That's my view. That's not reported. That's just my view of what ought to happen here, which is to hang back and just wait and see if Joe Biden stays in the basement. Because eventually, Bob, if, I don't know, if that come up on Washington, we can review the basement campaign. Has that term been used? Uh, look, I think it's possible that there are no debates. But at the same time, I think what President Trump's doing right now is negotiating. In, through about the Commission on Presidential Debates, about what he wants to happen. He's trying to set his terms. This is classic art of the deal. Take an extreme position, push people around, see how they react. Well, that is, but, I, but, uh, but the question was, on Washington Week in Review, has the term the basement campaign been used yet, to your knowledge? No, because it, that's, a, that's a loaded term. I mean, Biden is out of his basement in Delaware. He's had a few events. Um, and it's not for me to call him the basement campaign, but it's a campaign that is low profile. And uh, that's the strategy at this point, to not be trying to compete with Trump in all of his controversies. Because there's a belief in the Democratic Party that the voter could be exhausted by President Trump. And that instead of trying to compete with him at every step, you just kind of let your theme of a return to normal uh, be a, a, out there yeah, an option. A, a quick question. We don't have enough time. I don't think it's a loaded term. I think it's the actual description of where the studio is. But basement campaign will come to define Biden, whether or not journalists use it, because people like me use it. The question is, is that bad for Biden if it becomes a term, Robert Costa? If that becomes a thing, the basement campaign, is that bad for Biden? In a normal situation, being called a basement campaign, an underground campaign, doesn't seem like a positive thing. So I think you're, you're right, Hugh. But the only caveat here is they're in the midst of a global pandemic where a lot of people are spending time indoors. So you know, I, I, not for that, I don't know. I will watch on Washington Week in Review this week. I also think his little Twitter handle with the mask is a bad deal. But we will all see. We will all find out. Robert Costa, follow McCosta Reports on Twitter. Watch Washington Week in Review on Friday night. Stay tuned, America. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Gorka. I keep asking you the same question every week because I still don't get it. 
the greatest nation on God's earth, uh, until the coronavirus, the Wu flu, the biggest economy the world had ever seen, the markets returned to where they were pre-COVID, and then there's these weird skittish moments where, where there's a flutter on the market and there's a sudden drop because, what, four Apple stores are closing? Trish, what's going on? Well, yeah, you know, some people are, are nervous right now. There's still a lot of volatility out there because they're, they're trying to figure out, is this for real, right? Like, they, they want to make sure that this economic recovery is indeed for real. And when you hear about Apple stores shutting down, when you hear about states getting very nervous about reopening, they're saying to themselves, wait a second, we're not going to have a repeat of what we just went through, are we? And I think that the short answer to that is, of course, no. But nonetheless, it's how committed are American consumers going to be? How how committed is corporate America in this new environment to move forward? Um, and, and that's what it's going to come down to, right? Because if we start to backpedal here, if we start to say, okay, no, we're shutting everything down. If schools don't start in September, then you run the risk of another shutdown and another, you know, economic, frankly, catastrophe. Because that's what that was. They caused. This was sort of self-inflicted, an economic catastrophe. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Larry Elder Show. You know, the idea of shutting down our economy was just, you know, awful. I mean, and by the way, the people who suffered the most, Larry, were the lowest income people, black Americans. We have the best. Do you know, uh, Larry, from 2017 through 2020, what demographic group saw the fastest rise in incomes? Blacks. Black Americans. Mm -hmm. Yes, I knew you knew that. And, and my, you know, wait a minute. How could that happen? And we've got a racist president. How could that have happened? We had more economic advance in three years for black Americans under Trump than we did in eight years under Obama. Stephen Moore is my guest. Uh, he was an economic advisor to President Trump. Um, President Trump, to me, I could be completely wrong. You would know more than I would about this. Instinctively, he didn't want to shut down the economy, did he? Oh, Trump did not want to shut down the economy. No way. Mm -hmm. He got terrible advice from Fauci, who's, you know, a disaster as, the, as his uh, health advisor. Uh, and I'll tell you this, you know, we, we can't undo what has been done. But there, Donald Trump is not going to shut down this economy again. I guarantee you that. Mm -hmm. I mean, now the left is saying, oh, we have to shut down the economy again because we've had a few more cases of coronavirus. Uh, no. We, look, the vast, vast, vast majority of the, of the, uh, the people who've gotten very sick and have died from coronavirus are people over the age of 65 or 70. So let's keep those people healthy. But, uh, you know, we got to get, you can't keep an economy down. And I actually think it's because we did this, we locked down the economy for two or three months that we have these riots in the street. You can't keep young people locked up for with nothing to do, no jobs to go to, no income mm -hmm. for two or three months. And expect, you're, you're, you're creating a tinderbox and it was just waiting for a match. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. America has been doing some soul searching lately. Perhaps you noticed we're examining what's right with America and what can be made better. No other country does this kind of introspection better than us. Some of what we found we don't like and will change. Every life has the right to be treated with dignity and respect. That includes our law enforcement as well as every skin color. We've been through this before in America. and We always came out stronger. We will this time, too. Our hosts will make sure of that. We are The Answer. Welcome back. I'm here with Hewitt. 
There will be a big vote today on whether or not the United States Senate moves forward with police reform. Everybody I know wants police reform. Everybody I know wants a fairly uh, coherent set of measures. Democrats do not want Republicans to pass a police reform bill and the president to sign one. So they're going to block the Senator Tim Scott sponsored police reform action. Senator Scott was on Fox and Friends yesterday discussing what's going on. Cut number 14. I hear and I read in the House bill that they want more information so they can direct <laughs> training in the right direction. That's the foundation of our bill. They say they want more training around de-escalation. That's in our bill. They say they want to have the chokehold banned or reduced except for the life of the officer. That's in our bill. They say they want a duty to intervene and, and, and studying the use of force. Those are in our bill. They say they want us to look at recruiting more uh, officers to reflect the diversity and the demographics in their city. That's in our bill. They say they want to have uh, more information on best practices. That's in our bill. They say they want to talk about mental health experts. That's what the president's executive order says on co-responders. It's in our bill. Drug addiction, in our bill. Homelessness, in our bill. The, the, their priorities, fortunately and unfortunately for them, matches pretty well with the president's priorities. And those two match matches really well with my priorities and the Senate priorities the Republican side. So now we're having to ask a political question. If you get two thirds of you want what would you want out of the gate, why would you change the rules and change the goalposts? They said chokehold was the litmus test, but we had already put it in our bill. So they changed the goalposts. They do that because it seems like they're more interested in campaigns mm -hmm. than they are the vulnerable communities they say they serve. And when you feel like you own that vote, mm -hmm. you quit working hard for those people. Uh, Tim, Tim Scott is right. Democrats do not want police reform. They are opposed to police reform. And just, just remember that. They are opposed to police reform. They want the issue. They want the political benefits of the issue. They do not want the solution. And so they're blocking Tim Scott's bill. That's the reality. Nancy Pelosi is just naked uh, in what she's attempting to do, which is demonize Senate Republicans. Cut number 13. Here she is on CBS radio yesterday. In other words, for something to happen, they're going to have to face the realities of police brutality, the rallies of the need for justice in policing, and the recognition that there are many, many good people in, in um, law enforcement, but not all, and that we have to address those concerns. Uh, so when they admit that and and have some suggestions that are worthy of consideration, but so far they were trying to get away with murder, actually, the murder of George Floyd. Can you believe that? They're trying to get away with the murder of George Floyd. That's Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House. That's the Democratic Party. It's radical. What's going on in the markets brought to you by Andrew and Todd dot com. Uh, if you need to refinance your house, if you want to buy a house, if you want to buy a vacation home, if you want to buy an investment property, never has there been a better time to call 888-888-1172. Andrew and Todd, Doc Comber with Sierra Pacific Mortgage, they lend you the money. They actually lend you the money. They'll walk you through it. I've known them for decades. I've done my loan when I moved back to the Beltway. They've done loans for everybody I know, for thousands of people on this uh, uh in this radio audience. And every day they get more calls because every day people are moving up. They're helping their kids buy a house. They're helping senior citizens do a reverse mortgage. Whatever you need done, Andrew and Todd will get it done. Just call them at 888 -888 Yesterday, the Dow was up 131 points. The NASDAQ up 74, the S&P up 13. Now, overseas today, everything's red. But I don't know that that matters because I look at Amazon and yesterday it was up $50, and I think NASDAQ will continue to soar because of a story out of Brazil where online shopping in the world's, in the south, Southern Hemisphere's largest country in South America has gone up 60%. I think, I think what we see is not an up or down in the movement of the economy, but a sideways into technology and at home shopping. And so there's winners and losers. Make sure you pick well, but you're a winner if you're borrowing money from your house. AndrewandTodd.com. Stay tuned, America.
Trending now on The Dennis Prager Show. Hi, everybody. Dennis Prager with you. Somebody sent me a video of two uh, black guys who uh, were uh, big fans of America. And they showed video after video of quite awful conduct by police against whites. I remembered one of them where the guy was begging for his life, and it's not quite clear to anybody why he got killed. And said it, and they made the point, which is irrefutable. Had this been a black person, it, it, everybody would have known his name, and it would have been a, a major cause celeb in the United States. There is actually more of that against whites than against blacks, according to the, all the data that we have. The police are overwhelmingly not biased against blacks and certainly not in any use of lethal force. But the entire movement is not based on facts. It is based on emotion. And as far as the left is concerned, it is based on a desire for chaos and ultimately the end of the United States as we know it. If you're still in doubt, there's nothing I can say. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Mike Gallagher Show. The president was interviewed, I think on it was on Fox News, I think it was Sean Hannity. The president responded to what happened with, I think, uh, I don't think this is a controversial view, but maybe you do. Here was the president last night with Sean on Fox News Channel. I thought it was uh, a terrible situation, but... You can't resist a police officer. And, you know, if you have a disagreement, you have to take it up after the fact. It was a very sad, very, very sad thing. It's going to be up to justice. I hope he gets a fair shake because police have not been treated fairly in our country. They have not been treated fairly. Is President Trump uh, controversial with that remark? It was a very sad thing. He said it was a terrible thing. But you can't resist the police. Is resisting the police acceptable to anybody? Thank you to uh, whoever texted me on the My Pillow text line, the image of Leslie Nielsen. I think it's from Naked Gun. And again, all hell breaking loose behind him. And he's saying, he's saying, nothing to see here. Please disperse. That's what America feels like right now, isn't it? Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Eric Metaxas Show. Hey there, folks. Welcome. I'm talking to my friend Dinesh D'Souza. He has a new book out today. It's called United States of Socialism. Who's behind it? Why it's evil? How to stop it? I have to say that I have been uh, fascinated, not necessarily too surprised by the cravenness of uh, American corporations in their dealings with China. They're willing to do business with people whose view of human rights in the Communist Party in China is, is not that different uh, from slave owners uh, in, in America before the Civil War. In other words, it's very, very dirty money, and they don't seem to be using uh, the power they have uh, to get leverage over the human rights situation. They simply uh, seem to be willing uh, to let it ride. And it seems that Trump is the first president we've had that has identified the problem and that is willing to take on uh, China, which is, of course, a vast socialist communist power. What, what do you think of that situation? I think for corporations, you're quite right. They, they don't have any patriotic loyalty to the United States. Uh, they're happy to offshore, if you will, the slave labor. They're just looking at what in by, by and large is called the China price. If, in other words, if they can make something cheaper over there, we're just going to get it over there, mark it up, and then sell it over here. So Trump is fundamentally, he's a capitalist, but I think even more than that, he's a patriot. And he loves the country, and he looks out for America's interests. And he's kind of not bashful about that. And that itself is a little bit of a shock. So I think Trump, in that sense, is redefining the Republican Party uh, and essentially 
considering trade itself as part of the political process, which of course it is. But- Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. America has been doing some soul searching lately. Perhaps you noticed we're examining what's right with America and what can be made better. No other country does this kind of introspection better than us. Some of what we found we don't like and will change. Every life has the right to be treated with dignity and respect. That includes our law enforcement as well as every skin color. We've been through this before in America. Let's make sure of that. We are the answer. Welcome back, America. That music means the smart guys are with us. Dean Irwin Chemerinsky of the Berkeley School of Law in, of course, Berkeley, California. And John Eastman, Dean Emeritus of the Chapman University Fowler School of Law. John is on the right. Irwin is on the left. They help us when we get close to the end of a term. Welcome, gentlemen. John, I'm going to have you go first this week. The case that has waited the longest of the 14 left at the court is Espinoza versus Montana Department of Revenue. It's a Blaine Amendment case. It matters a lot. Would you explain to people what the Blaine Amendments are and why this case has taken so long, in your opinion, to get out of the court? Well, it, it's a mini Blaine Amendment case, uh, you know, in the middle of the last century, uh, actually century before the last century you now, uh, uh, Representative Blaine tried to get a constitutional amendment federalizing uh, an anti-Catholic uh, view that no taxpayer funds could go uh, to support uh, religious uh, entities, uh, and it was mainly aimed at Catholic schools that were competing with the the Protestant schools that had become the main uh, common schools of the of, of the country. Uh, that amendment effort failed, but a lot of states adopted many Blaine amendments for their own state laws, uh, and it now treats uh, r- religious entities uh, discriminatorily differently than anybody else. Um, and uh, at, at issue in Espinoza is whether uh, the state's uh, mini Blaine Amendment prohibits uh, the state's uh, voucher program from allowing parents to choose a religious school for their kids. Um, and and uh, the significance of this is, is, is dramatic because if, if following a, a case, Supreme Court case a few years ago uh, that held that a religious school was entitled to get state-funded support for their playground um, uh, equipment and and they had a program to put down, you know, softeners on the ground so that kids wouldn't hurt themselves. Uh, they were entitled to that on an equal basis uh, uh, by virtue of the federal constitution. Um, and and that, would, that would invalidate Blaine amendments that treat religious schools differently than, than any other entity just on on, on grounds other than the consideration of religion, uh, and and it can it can therefore have a dramatic impact on the number of states uh, that have these many Blaine amendments. I don't know off the top of my head how many, but I'd guess uh, a dozen or two dozen or so. So, Irwin, uh, John has described it. Why do you think it's taken so long? And interesting, court watchers note that from that term, only Justice uh, Breyer and Chief Justice Roberts have not yet issued an opinion leading uh, us to believe that one or the other will be writing this opinion. What do you think happens here? The Montana Supreme Court found that this Montana law violated the Montana Constitution and struck it down. Therefore, there is no law for the Supreme Court to review. You can only review a law if there is a state law and the Montana Supreme Court invalidated it. Now, the argument that's being made on the other side would in essence say that states constitutionally obligated to fund religion when they fund secular institutions. That would say any time a secular institution gets money, the government is obligated to fund a religious institution. That would be truly a radical change in the law. And the question is, will the court be willing to go that far? John Eastman, that is a different way of describing, because I think the Blaine Amendment, the, the mini Blaine Amendment, is front and square before the court. And I expect Justice Roberts to write for a majority striking it down. But that might be the wish giving hope to the uh, to the argument. Well, you know, Justice Roberts is uh, not exactly in good stead in, in, in my side of the political aisle these days after his ridiculous decision in the DACA cases last week or uh, the decision joining uh, Neil Gorsuch uh, three days earlier. 
uh, in the, the transgender cases uh, involving Title VII. So who knows what he's planning on doing. Um, the, but the fact of the matter is, the Montana Supreme Court considered whether the Blaine Amendment was unconstitutional uh, on, under the federal constitution uh, and said that it was, uh, it was not and therefore the state's program providing uh, aid on an equal basis to religious institutions uh, and remember, uh, where the parents decide to send their kids. This isn't the state funding the religious institution. It's funding the parents and then the parents got to decide which, which of the private uh, schools they got to send their kids to, which the Supreme Court um, in uh, in the Ohio School Vouchers case a while back upheld as perfectly constitutional. So the issue is whether the Blaine Amendment itself uh, requiring the discrimination against the religious schools is constitutional, and that is front and center before the Supreme Court. Now, Erwin, two things to you. Uh, John got in a dig at the Chief Justice. I think he's a great Chief Justice. John thinks I'm a wet. You know, I'm kind of one of those center-right people that think the Chief Justice is doing a great job. Uh, do you think he's turned into a liberal? And then to the question of whether or not the Blaine, mini Blaine Amendment is squarely before the court. First, John Roberts is no liberal. <laughs> Overall, he's voted the way conservatives want in the last 15 years since he's been Chief Justice. Now, we can certainly debate his decision in the DACA case. Or we can debate his joining the opinion with regard to Title VII and discrimination and sexual orientation. But overall, he is a conservative justice, just not always as conservative as John wants. Second, in terms of the mini Blaine Amendment, I think the question is, can states choose to not fund religion in the same way they fund secular institutions? I think the First Amendment to the Constitution says that they're required to do that. James Madison said there's nothing more repugnant than to tax a person to support a religion he or she doesn't believe in. But beyond that, 43 states have some form of state constitutional provision that prevents government money from being used to support religion. What John is now saying is all of those restrictions are unconstitutional. I can't imagine the Supreme Court's going to go that far. So I believe that uh, we'll see the prediction next week. I think Montana is going to lose this and uh, the free exercise is going to win. John, take us to Our Lady of Guadalupe, which I told Al Sharpton on Saturday, uh, a Sunday. It's actually the most important case left for people of faith. This matters a great deal. Would you explain why? Well, Our Lady of Guadalupe involves, uh, uh, again, largely anti-Catholic uh, interpretation of the law at the moment, but it, uh, it involves other religions as well. So uh, the Supreme Court a few years ago held that um, uh, religious institutions are exempt from Title VII's anti-discrimination rules when they're dealing with people who, who teach the doctrine of the church. Uh, in the particular case, it involved a, a, a Protestant who had a title as minister. Now, the Catholic Church and other religious entities don't use the word minister nearly as frequently uh, as some of the Protestant sects do. Uh, but the person involved in this case, a school teacher who teaches religious doctrine, among other things, in her duties, uh, is, is identical. So the question is, does the uh, ministerial exemption that the court has held is required by the Constitution apply uh, equally to religious entities that do not use the word minister, but but when the same type of religious indoctrination, religious uh, conveyance duties are involved. And I think the Supreme Court's going to have to say, yes, we look at the duties involved rather than the title that's given. Otherwise, the Supreme Court itself will be participating in a discrimination against particular religions. Erwin Chemerinsky. First, I don't think it's the most important case. I think the cases involving subpoenas to President Trump's banks and accountants are the most important cases because they go to the heart of the rule of the law is the president above the law. But second, as to this case, I think what John is saying then is that any religious institution, or at least any religious school, has a complete exemption from all anti-discrimination law, that it should be free to discriminate on any basis it wants. And I don't see the Supreme Court going that far. The question is, where do you draw the line as to when a religious institution should be able to discriminate? So far, the court has said, well, it's about who they designate as ministers. If they rule in favor of the religious schools here, then a religious school is simply exempt from all anti-discrimination law. I don't think it's a good idea, and I don't think the court wants to go that far. So, Erwin, my statement was it's the most important case to religious conservatives. You might be right on the uh, Trump cases. Why don't you give us one minute on, on what's at issue in those? 
Sure. What's involved here is two cases that involve congressional subpoenas to financial institutions that do business with President Trump, and a third case involves a state grand jury subpoena to a financial institution, an accountant that does business with President Trump. And President Trump has come in and said, I'm president. You can't subpoena these records. And to me, as I said, I think this is really the question. Is the president of the United States above the law? Uh, John Eastman? Well, look, I mean, we got to remember what's going on here. This is part of an ongoing effort to undo uh, the, the results of the 2016 election. It's really been rather extraordinary. Nothing like this has happened in our history uh, with refusal to accept the results of the election, except twice, uh, 1800, uh, and and the Federalists were finally brought kicking and screaming on board with the, the, the fact that Jefferson had won the election, and then 1860, uh, when uh, when the South refused to accept the election of, a, uh, of Abraham Lincoln. This is part and parcel of that to try and scour the universe to find something that would undermine this president and be able to get him out of office. Uh, there's a reason uh, every Department of Justice of both uh, political parties has said that the president can't be prosecuted uh, or indicted uh, while he's in office. The president, the office of the president itself is bigger than the one man that holds it. That doesn't mean he's above the law. He could still be held accountable after the fact. But this, this is a scour of the earth effort to try and find something that we can tag this president with. And we're not talking about conduct that he did while in office. Uh, we're talking about, you know, looking at tax returns back 10 to 15 years to try and find something there that he must have done something wrong someplace so that we can get him. Uh, Irwin, last, last, last word, word. Irwin, because we got 30 seconds. In the context of New York, it's whether or not hush money was paid to Stormy Daniels and Karen McDougal so as to help the campaign, and whether that violates state campaign finance law. That's not scouring there. That's something we know from Michael Cohen occurred. It's a question of whether there's a felony before taking office. And in Clinton versus Jones, the Supreme Court said presidents don't have immunity for acts that occurred prior to taking office. Gentlemen, it is always great to hear from the smart guys, Erwin Chemerinsky from Berkeley Law School, where he is the dean, John Eastman, dean emeritus of the Fowler School of Law at Chapman University. Thanks to you both. We'll be back next week to see where the predictions come out because I think we're going to be done by this time next week. There's going to be a lot of cases, though. Maybe, maybe it will take an extra week. They normally don't have July decisions. Thank you both, gentlemen. Time for me to remind you. ReliefFactor.com. Uh, don't leave home without it. Uh, I got one more segment, then I'm out on the road. Trundling around. Um, maybe I'll do them all today. Uh, trundling around at the speed of a garden hose, uh, right? That, that's actually. Garden hoses are faster than I am when you turn the water on. They move faster than I do. But I get out there because relieffactor.com makes it possible. Do not forget. I carry in Kirkham and his Veritron Omega. Take it every day. I take it in the first hour. I remind you two more times. Don't leave home without it. Different people tune in at different times. I remind all of you, if you haven't got it yet, 1995 three-week trial supply, give it a try. Also remember, Honor Bound Coffee. Now, I pause here and say to you, I know you had coffee this morning. Most of you people are normal. And so I know there's some non-coffee drinkers out there, but most of you people are normal. The best coffee in the world is made by Honor Bound Coffee. Four different grinds, four different blends, 16 different choices. Once you go to honorboundcoffee.com and click on one of those choices, it will be sent to your house and will continue to come to your house until you tell them to stop. Well, you'll, you'll never tell them to stop because you'll love it. Every dollar of profit from Honor Bound Coffee goes to support military families, every single dollar. Pete and Seth Talbot started ReliefFactor.com. It became the most successful supplement project, I believe, in uh, a product in America. And they said, well, we're going to give back. We're going to start another company. They bought a coffee company. They've turned it into a gem. They've improved it. And they did subscription services like they do with ReliefFactor.com. But the difference is, with Honor Bound Coffee, same great product, same great team, same great everything. But every dollar of profit goes to support beginning Semper Fi and America's Fund, Semper Fi Fund, America's Fund. Get involved. HonorBoundCoffee.com makes it easy to both drink your coffee and help military families. Please join. I'll be right back with uh, Alex Colodin, the future of Arizona, when we return. Trending now on the Mike Gallagher Show. The president 
was interviewed, right. I think on it was on Fox News, I think it was Sean Hannity. The president responded to what happened with, I think, uh, I don't think this is a controversial view, but maybe you do. Here was the president last night with Sean on Fox News Channel. I thought it was uh, a terrible situation, but you can't resist a police officer. And, you know, if you have a disagreement, you have to take it up after the fact. It was a very sad very, very sad thing. It's going to be up to justice. I hope he gets a fair shake because police have not been treated fairly in our country. They have not been treated fairly. Is President Trump uh, controversial with that remark? It was a very sad thing. He said it was a terrible thing. But you can't resist the police. Is resisting the police acceptable to anybody? Thank you to uh, whoever texted me on the My Pillow text line the image of Leslie Nielsen. I think it's from Naked Gun. And again, all hell breaking loose behind him. And he's saying, he's saying, nothing to see here. Please disperse. That's what America feels like right now, isn't it? Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. This is Lon Hee Chen of the Hoover Institution for townhall.com. Public health officials across America have spent the last several months warning about the dangers of the coronavirus and the need for us to stay at home, halt economic activity, and avoid social interactions with our friends and neighbors. We are now reopening our economy in many parts of the country, but these same public health officials have compromised their own credibility as we do so. On the one hand, they've urged caution and a slow return to work, school, and faith gatherings. They've criticized those who oppose the stay-at-home orders. But at the same time, these officials have been broadly supportive of the large protests on America's streets in the last few weeks. Public health officials should be helping us understand the comparative risks of activities, not endorsing the causes they like while prohibiting the ones they don't. Their hypocrisy is costly indeed. They have impacted our ability to address future health crises. I'm Lon Hee Chen. Attention business owners, as America gets back to work, will customers know you're there? With little warning, the coronavirus attacked our nation and our well-being in ways we never anticipated. The tragic loss of life. Us expect to spend more in advertising by the end of June, and more than half expect to restart or surge their spending by this summer. As the numbers forecast increased spending from advertisers across the country, will your message be seen and heard? Will your business benefit from the pent-up consumer demand? Salem Surround is prepared to help you deliver the right advertising message to reach all potential customers wherever they are. Your business can be ready for a post-COVID-19 economy, but the time to act is now. Be at the front of the line as our economy begins to fire on all cylinders once again. For a free assessment of your marketing message and strategy, visit SalemSurround.com or contact your local media strategist today. Welcome back, America to Hewitt. Normally, I don't do this because state legislative races don't care. They, the whole country doesn't care about him. But I'm very interested in Alex Colodin. He is running in Arizona. He's backed by my friends at the Center for Arizona Policy. He's backed by all my friends in Arizona. And he's young, a young Republican running in Arizona for the state Senate. Alex, welcome to the program. Great to have you on. Thanks for having me on, Hugh. I'm excited to be here. All right. The website is Alex4AZ, Alex, A L E X the number four AZ. The Twitter handle is real Alex Culloden. Why are you doing this? I hate state legislators. <laughs> well, Hugh, I think state legislators are the most interesting places in American politics. People think the federal government uh, is the place that governs their lives. But actually, on a day to day basis, what the state legislature does is much more impactful. And as a conservative, especially a young conservative that's interested in more creative policy solutions, at the state level, you have the freedom to experiment and to try new things. They're the laboratories of democracy. So for a young person, it's just about the most exciting place that you can be. 
Now, you are pro-life. You are pro-religious freedom. You're everything that the cat people like and Doug Ducey likes and everyone likes down there. But the Arizona State Senate, is is it still a supermajority Republican? No, not at all. In fact, it's a very uh, narrow Republican majority. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I'm running besides my interest uh, in, in state legislative issues is, you know, my opponent uh, has had some personal scandals uh, with respect to uh, her dealings with lobbyists and staffers and pressuring them into into relations that they may not like uh, that that will prevent us from holding this seat. And that could cost the Republican Party the majority in the Arizona State Senate. So I'm very concerned about that. Where is the district, Alex? So the district is Scottsdale, Fountain Hills, Rio Verde. Uh, if you're familiar with the area, it's in the east. Oh, yeah, Valley. you've got my radio station there. Uh, that's where I broadcast out of whenever I'm in Arizona. Fantastic. So, so why is, what got you on this path? Because right now in every state in the union, 50 states, there are 50 legislative bodies that are holding uh, elections and thousands of people have put their hands up. Why did you put your hand up? Well... Like I said, besides the interest, there's been a Republican that's held the seat for 10 years, but she's done things that, that make me uncomfortable being represented by her. You know, my generation is millennials. You know, we're still a very pro-life generation. Uh, and she sponsored the ERA, which, as you know, is a constitutional right to abortion. She did it three times. This is a conservative district, and there's no reason that we should be sending the senator to Phoenix uh, that does something like that. I mean, Arizona should be a freedom state, a state that stands up for the rights of the unborn, not a state that votes to ratify uh, the ERA. Uh, so that made me very uncomfortable. You know, sometimes people get into office and then 10 years later, they become less of a conservative. Uh, and that's what happened here. So it's time for new blood. You're a University of Pennsylvania lawyer. So you're a smart lawyer. You're a Goldwater Institute Reagan fellow. That means you're a conservative and you've got cap behind you. Nevertheless, taking on an incumbent is very difficult. How goes the race? It goes really well. You know, we go out there in the community and people go, oh, you can't campaign during a pandemic, you know. But I found you go to people's doors and they'll talk to you through the door, you know. And when you talk to them about the race and explain to them what's at stake, they are very receptive, uh, and so I'm feeling very, very good about our chances. As you said, it's very rare for an incumbent to get the door endorsements that we have, not only CAP, but Arizona Right to Life. Uh, and so I think that's a sign of just how viable and powerful this race and our movement is. Legislative District 23, when is the election, Alex? So the election is August 4th, but early ballots will start showing up in people's mailboxes July 8th. So, it, you know... The idea of campaigning in the summer in Arizona, I've always thought is insane, but people do it. They do it. Yeah, we, we do. I mean, I'm an Arizona boy, so I, I put on my suit and tie and go walk, and people look at me like I'm crazy. I go, I grew up here. The heat, the heat feels good. So you're a Georgetown University guy as well. Are, are you Catholic? Uh, no, actually. I'm Jewish. <laughs> but How did you end up in Georgetown? Catholic. Um. So, so I was always interested in policy, uh, and uh, of course, even though I'm not Catholic, I really like uh, I like the religious bent of the school, right? I like that it's not an entirely secular college education. That philosophy and theology are really uh, are really important to the school. And actually, at, at Georgetown, I ended up studying uh, for two years under under a famous rabbi who was on faculty there and learning more and becoming more deeply in touch with my Judaism. So, yeah, the Catholics are 100% in my book. Well, I gotta, I gotta tell you, you, a Georgetown George undergrad, Penn, Penn Law, Law, Goldwater, Goldwater Institute, Institute, Reagan fellow, cap endorsement, Arizona right to life. You're the dream conservative. Good luck, Alex Colodin. Always a pleasure. Keep coming back between now and July. I do that once in a while, America, to remind you no matter where you are, there's somebody who needs your help in politics. You don't have to help uh, the Biden campaign. You don't have to help the Trump campaign. There are lots of campaigns everywhere where young people are trying desperately to get involved in politics. It's much better than pulling down a statute. Go stuff an envelope. Go walk a precinct. Go do something that actually matters. Go to alex4az.com to find out more and come back tomorrow, America, for the next Hugh Hewitt Show.